Half of Exile can be a pretty intimidating game to start out with. And that's mostly because the game doesn't really do any hand-holding, but there's some good information out there. The problem is very often that it is quite scattered. But the game is so awesome that I think it is worth putting in time to get new players into the game and to help people out who are just about to start. Now, you might have noticed the video is quite long and that is for a reason because all of these informations that are usually scattered, I want to have in one place. But you do not have to watch this whole video. We will have very, very aggressive timestamps. Chapter one will be the basics. So everything that you kind of need to know to get through the campaign, to understand your first steps and to know where you're going. Now, I didn't just like rattle off information and like tell you what's going on. I'm also trying to kind of get you to understand things so you can kind of connect the dots yourself as well. So if you just want to jump into the game and have some context for it, you can watch that section first and come back later. For example, to chapter two, which is going to be all about Path of Exile's endgame, which is way too vast to explain in one video, but I will give you a feel for it and the scope that we're looking at. Then in chapter three, I'm going to talk about league mechanics. Half of Exile has these content cycles every three to four months that are called leaks. And whenever a new leak comes out, the game is vastly changed and there is an introduction of something new happening all across the world. And after the league is over, these often get merged with the main game and they stay. So as you can imagine, a game that has been out for like a decade, there is going to be a lot of stuff to explain here. But I will obviously only explain the ones that are relevant to you. And at the end, I have a miscellaneous section, which is basically just where I put everything. I didn't know where else to put. So monetization, for example, how is Path of Exile monetized? And if you want to support the game, it is free to play. If you want to support the game, where should you allocate that? I also talk about stuff like optimal settings, how to get a loot filter and so on. But yeah, this is the first time I make an ambitious video like this. So uh, if you have some feedback, definitely drop it down in the comments. So whenever you enter the game for the first time, this is going to be the screen whenever you make a new character. It's going to ask you, which league do you want to play? Now, the default selected is going to be the Challenge League, which I would also recommend to you. So Challenge Leagues are these three to four month cycles of new content drops that are only playable in here. And it's basically an even playing field for everybody. The economy gets reset, everybody levels a new character. Then we have Standard, which you can kind of see as this museum of old characters. Whenever a Challenge League finishes, it goes to Standard. Now. You could just start in standard and say, oh, I don't need the newest content drop. But the problem is the economy is completely inflated by people playing for over a decade. So all that will really happen is you can't afford anything. And yeah, you just have less than in whatever challenge league there currently is. So highly recommended. Quickly to talk about hardcore. If you're somebody who really likes hardcore usually in games, I would say that's totally fine, but I would still start your first few characters on softcore. Now, hardcore challenge league basically means if you die, your character goes to standard down here immediately. If you die on softcore, you lose 10% of your current level XP. I would really get some experience first on softcore, understand what you're dying to. There's a lot of unfair deaths, a lot of weird deaths. There is bosses that honestly, straight up, if you do no research before, have like one shot mechanics that you won't even see coming. In general, this game is not really balanced around hardcore. So I would definitely go with normal Crucible softcore first, get some experience and then later dip into hardcore. There's two more things you can tick down here. The first one is solo cell phone. Solo cell phone means that you basically can't trade with other people. You're solo on your own. The only thing you have is crafting and stuff you pick up from the ground. And you can just see this as like sort of a badge of honor and you can revert this at any point you want. So it's kind of just bragging rights. Honestly, as a new player, I think it's fine if you want to go solo self -hunt. I would explore a little bit in the economy. It's definitely going to make your experience a lot easier. You're going to progress faster and learn faster. But I think solo self -hunt is definitely debatable. And then at the end, just forget that Roofless exists. This is basically a mode for people who have like 10,000 hours in the game or people who play like the beta and they really wish back the times whenever this game was super slow and kind of clunky. If you want to do that, check it out, I guess. But definitely don't do it on your first character. All right, now we click on Crucible and we get to the character selection screen, the probably most important thing in any ERPG. Now, there are in total seven different classes in Path of Exile. However, if it's your first time playing, you will not see the Scion. You unlock the Scion at the end of Act 3. Now, important to know when it comes to Path of Exile, every character can use any skill in the game. 
What separates these characters is the starting point on the huge passive skill tree, as well as the subclasses called ascendancies that you can use. What that means is you can play a witch that slams the ground or spins around in a circle with a weapon, while you can also have a marauder that is a spellcaster. Is that something that makes sense? Sometimes it actually is, and some of the most broken builds come from things that maybe aren't as obvious, which is one of the beauties of Path of Exile. But this kind of freedom can also be very, very intimidating at the start, especially this passive skill tree, which we're going to talk about later in detail. Now, my recommendation for everybody would be start with a build guide. Now, I want to make this clear. This doesn't mean you have to use my build guides. There's a lot of great content creators out there. What I'm saying is... A build guide alleviates a lot of knowledge base and it teaches you a lot about the game. It just alleviates a lot of friction. If you have to focus on making your character while exploring the world, while learning how everything works, that is even more overwhelming. And most people who just jump in blind will quit the game. That is the state Path of Exile is currently in and it is kind of hard to learn. Even if you follow a build guide, your first few characters will kind of suck because you won't exactly transition it to the screen but it's definitely better than starting blind. Making your own characters is kind of a thing that you earn in this game, but if you don't want me to tell you, I will still present you the classes and you can still jump in blind if you want to. This is just highly recommended. All right, so the subclasses you will unlock later, round about in the middle of the campaign. For you, it's probably going to be somewhere around level 35 to 45. I explain how you do that and all the subclasses later in the video. Timestamp will be on the screen right here. But all you need to know is first you just have to pick your normal class, starting with the Templar. Now, the Templar is sort of your battle mage of Path of Exile. It can be attack focused, it can be defensively focused. It usually revolves around elemental damage, but you can also get it into other directions. Like, for example, totems, which are these turrets that you put down that deal damage for you. Then we have the Shadow, which is sort of your assassin y type of guy. It also has a subclass that's called Assassin. More on that later. In general, Fast, good damage, a little bit lacking on the defense, just overall very, very solid character and very solid starting area. It also specializes in stuff like traps and mines. Then we have the Marauder, which is your typical melee character, bonk, spinning around, having a lot of HP, good defense, good offense, but it has to be in the midst of things. Now then we have the Scion, which you will only unlock somewhere at the end of Act 3. And the thing about Scion is its ascendancies, its subclass, there's just one subclass and you can kind of take a little bit from every other class. It seems good because it starts in the middle of the passive tree and it kind of seems like, oh, it can get anywhere. In reality, it's actually quite hard to make work. So I would definitely, even if you already unlocked Act 3, not recommend a Scion anytime soon. It is the definition of an all-rounder character and just build whatever you want. But in Path of Exile, if you don't know what you're doing, that is actually a big downside. After that, we have the Ranger, which pretty much self-explanatory the name. It's about bows. It's about being incredibly fast, projectile based. It doesn't even have to be bows, just projectile based. It also has a little bit of a flask sub theme. Very good positioning on the passive tree as well. You can get pretty good defensive value on top of everything else. Evasion and we're going to talk about that later. Spell suppression. Then we have the Duelist. My personal favorite here it has incredibly strong subclasses as well as that it's sort of like a Marauder, but a little bit more elegant. It's usually attack focused. So as a caster, you're not going to be too happy. But whether you're ranged, whether you're melee, great character overall you can go more defensive you can be an all-rounder just really really strong pick and then at the end here we have the witch which is sort of like the sorcerer of this game there's a ton of things you can do with this the main minion class necromancer is on witch you can specialize more into elemental stuff you can go a little bit more into the dark route with like chaos damage and stuff like that which overall is a very, very solid caster class, especially for a newcomer. Now to explain the basics of the game, we're going to choose which and we're just going to jump in. All right. So first, when you enter the game, you will see the interface down here. We have our life globe. There's also shield, which is energy shield, which would normally protect your life even further. We have the flasks, which are basically consumables that can restore life, like here, life flask, mana flask, but can also be utility flasks. So it can give you stuff like movement speed or even passive bonuses while the flask is up. And on the right side, we have the mana globe, 
as well as that the skill bar right here also a shop button just so you know i'll talk about monetization later but there's no like pay to win in path of exile it is just there basically if you want to make your character look fancier or you want to have more stuff to store your items in now we just picked up our first item which is this driftwood wand right here so let's quickly kill this dude this hungry corpse right here and maybe it's gonna drop something oh look it's a fireball so here's the thing in this game i just said earlier every class can use every skill that there is in the game and i meant that fireball can be used on any class any skill can be used in any class the way these skills are packaged are with gems right for example this gem right here it has a level it can level up it gets stronger with level but it has to be socketed into one of your items. Just to make clear, it does not have to be your weapon. It's not like offensive gems have to go into weapon and defensive have to go into your body. It's completely, forget that thought immediately. It doesn't matter for the most part. Now put your fireball in here and you will see on your skill bar, there appears a fireball. And now you can actually use the fireball. Look right here. You also have the default attack, which I would basically just forget about immediately. Default attack is not really a thing in this game. Put it on move only. The main reason for this is this is going to force you into attacking. So if you move with left mouse button and you hover over an enemy, it's going to walk there and attack that enemy with like a very weak attack, which you don't want. Put it to move only. If you really want default attack for the first few attacks, you can still bind it on something else. All right. So now we got our first weapon, our first skill. We just found something interesting that's called Arcane Search Support. This is also a gem, but it's not a skill gem, so it doesn't give you a skill, but it enhances your skills. However, in order for it to enhance your skill, these sockets, right, which are both blue, have to be connected. Let us let me kill this guy real quickly. This one as well, if I can hit him. So, for example, I put Arcane Surge in here. You can see, like, a small symbol up here with an N, and this means that the Arcane Surge is now supporting Fireball, and it gives me the Arcane Surge buff up here important to note is that it makes your fireball cost more mana so the more links you have the more you support something with the more expensive it's going to get so it is kind of like a give and take but almost in any case you want to have a ton of support on your damage dealer and once again there has to be this connection in between here which is called a link all right so we now got into town for the first time let's talk about some of the very very basics so we just saw an active skill gem right it has certain tags. So, for example, it says projectile, spell, AoE, and fire. What these refer to basically are on the passive skill tree, which we're going to talk about later. That means that, for example, when it says spell damage or projectile damage or area damage, it will count for the skill. Same with fire damage because it's also a tag, right? Now, that's very important to know because you kind of know which points you want to take, which points you want to avoid. It is not 100% true, but usually it is. And then as for the support gem, we have stuff like support, which means it's not a, really a skill. It just supports a skill. It is arcane, which in this sense doesn't really mean anything. It's a spell as well. And it is duration based. Now, when it comes to these active skill gems, the biggest distinction is probably spell versus attack. And that also is important because attacks scale with attack speed, spells scale with cast speed. So for example, if I get 10% attack speed from somewhere, it does nothing for your fireball because it is a spell. However, something like ground slam, which is an attack, once again, AOE, slam, melee, it will work. I can also do stuff like faster projectiles for my projectiles to travel faster, as you can see right here. It's basically almost instant, right? And then the same thing goes for AOE skills. You can increase AOE. You can also make AOE smaller, but get more damage. There's a lot of trade-offs to be had here. But on the other hand, there's not just transformative support gems. There's also just normal damage multipliers. So for example, here, we just have straight up supported attack deals 20% more elemental damage. Doesn't change how the skill looks or functions, just makes you more powerful. Another important thing about gems. So whenever you kill monsters, you get experience, but your gems also get part of that experience and they can level up. Gems only get experience when they are socketed into any of your gear. And I mean any, it does not have to be your main gear set. There's also a weapon swap. And here you can have up to nine different sockets. Usually it's gonna be around about six, for example, when you have two one-handers and you can socket them in and they gain EXP as normal. However, while they're in your offhand, you cannot use them. So that is a neat little thing right there. Let's quickly kill something and you will see on the right side, 
there appears I shot because it has enough experience to level. Important to know, until you actually click the plus here and you level it up, it doesn't gain any more XP. So for example, if you don't have enough dexterity to level up this gem, you can't just wait until later and then level it up 12 times. You will have to do it one by one. So if you left click on the plus, that means that it will get leveled up. However, maybe you don't want it to be leveled up, right? You can actually right click the plus and it will disappear right here. And you just did not level it up. The progress is stopped. If at any point you want to redo that, you will see ice shot is now down here in your inventory and you can still click plus and level it up later whenever you can or you need to. Now, in order to talk about sockets and links and stuff like that further we need to first talk about attributes there are three main attributes in the game strength which gives you plus one life per two strength and a one percent increased melee damage per five strength which is sort of your melee attribute you could say intelligence which is sort of your caster attribute per two intelligence you get a plus one mana for five intelligence, you get 1% energy shield, which once again is sort of like this thing that you have over your life protecting it that regens over time. And then you also have dexterity, which is sort of your ranged attribute, you could say. Per one dexterity, you get plus two accuracy. And per five dexterity, you get plus 1% evasion. Now, most importantly, you will see all the colors. Strength is red, intelligence is blue, and dexterity is green. If you get that into your head as soon as possible, everything will make a lot more sense. Your socket colors are themed around those attributes. Your skill gems are themed around those attributes. A lot of the things in the game will kind of signal you what they're for. Keep that in mind whenever you play the game. Importantly though, which is different from a lot of other RPGs, is your main stat is not really all that strong. These are just like something you have to get, right? Like there are certain requirements that you need to equip your gems and your items and that's something you have to meet, but by no means should you just be jumping and getting more attributes. I mean, for example, right? What does stacking intelligence really do? It gives me some mana and some energy shield. Doesn't give me damage, doesn't give me like really anything. If I'm not interested in mana or energy shield, in fact, it's completely useless. There are exceptions here. There are certain builds that specialize in attributes, but in general, you should be looking at meeting your attribute requirements to equip the gear you want to equip and to level up the gems you want to level. Because gems, whenever they level up, need more and more attributes. All right, so strength red, intelligence blue, dexterity green. The socket colors are basically exactly the same. You can have blue sockets, you can have green sockets, and you can have red sockets. And funnily enough, they also have something to do with the item they're on. For example, this item here requires 17 dexterity, which means it has more chance to get green sockets. By the way, all of these sockets and links, you can manipulate them, you can craft. For example, right here, I have an end game bow that requires 212 dexterity. The chance to get anything but green is pretty low. Once again, there's crafting involved. You can do that later. Just so you know, if I would try and recraft this most of the time, I would get green sockets. Now, in order to talk more about sockets, links, and colors, I have to quickly introduce to you the currency system in Path of Exile, which obviously can't just be gold, right? It is actually a slew of different crafting materials. So where normal games often have like a main currency, gold, platinum, whatever, this game has certain things that people can exchange with each other. Usually the main trading currency are chaos orbs, but it can differ from what people want, right? And all of these currencies aren't just like static currency, they do something. For example, the jeweler orb, right? One of the currencies reforges the number of sockets on an item. So if I put that right here and I put it on my helmet, now I have two sockets. If I take the orb of fusing out here, this will connect these links. If I take a chromatic orb right here, this reforges the colors of certain items, right? So yeah you can kind of customize your character as you want with all of these currencies. I will talk about all of these later in a section, a little bit too intimidating right now, but all we need is the jeweler orb, the orb of fusing at the chromatic orb. Orb of fusings are a little bit rarer, but jeweler orbs and chromatic orbs you're going to find quite frequently. Also, just as a small side note, you can actually, if you have three different colors that are linked together, sell that to the vendor and you will get one chromatic orb. This is called a vendor recipe. So for example, here we got another 
extra chromatic orb. Important to know about these currencies is I just did this pretty easily, right? But the higher you go in sockets and the higher you go in links, the harder it gets to actually get what you want. You don't always hit. So for example, if I apply a jeweler orb to this item, it can also go down one, right? So it's completely random and you should know that. Same with linking and same with colors. However, once again, there is an affinity for colors for items. For example, here requires 20 dexterity. This will have an affinity for green sockets. So if you, for example, are trying to get two green sockets on this armor helmet, armor being strength requirement, you will have a lot of problems. So talk more about your gear, for example, your helmet or your gloves or your boots. There are three different defensive types, armor, energy shield, and evasion. And they once again go back to attributes and colors. Armor base types need strength, which is once again red, more red sockets, right? We have energy shield type, more blue sockets, and it requires intelligence and evasion, which requires dexterity and has more green sockets. There is also mixed types. For example, here you see armor and evasion, and it requires strength and dexterity. Usually it will require less though. For example, a helmet maybe in endgame takes 160 strength, but if it is hybrid, it will maybe take like 120 strength and 120 dexterity. All right, so we now understand basically anything that's on this item. It has armor evasion, which means it needs strength and dexterity, and it has a level requirement, for example. But to understand what's going on with like stats and stuff, because there's nothing on this item, right? It's just a normal white item. We have to go back to our currency stash. There are four rarities of items. The first one is normal, as you see it right here. The second one is magic, which can have up to two mods. This is a little bit of a weird example because there's like a hybrid mod right here. But if you press alt, you will see there's the first mod, which gives you armor and evasion and some block recovery and the second one, which give you strength. Then we have as the third one, the rare, which can have up to six stats. You can find these underground. You don't have to craft them or anything. But just for this example right here, we did that. And there is also a last category, which is a unique item. These are rare items in the game that are either just super generically powerful or that can completely revolve around. So for example, an item that you make a build around, right? And they are always the same. And they basically always have the same base type, always have the same mod. So for example here, this is a very, very sought after leveling item, which gives you 50% movement speed. All right, so we talked about gems. We talked about attributes and colors. We now know what items kind of look like. There's different kind of items, right? We know what everything here does. But now we have to open the one thing that makes a lot of people quit in this game, which is the passive tree. Now, the passive skill tree is an intricate web of passive bonuses for your character and yeah whenever you level up you get a skill point and you can allocate it somewhere you also get more skill points from certain quests this is the most integral part of the game when it comes to crafting your build and just to make this easier digestible i have the graphic on the screen right now unfortunately can't zoom it out more but basically it is once again related back to attributes and colors so you have a strength side, you have a dexterity side, and you have an intelligence side. This is really important to note because it will once again harp back to where the characters start on the passive tree. For example, we're a witch and we start up here in the intelligence area, right here. If you're a marauder and you're strength based, you will start down here in the strength area. And if you're a ranger, you guessed it, you start in the dexterity area. And then the rest of the classes are kind of in between. For example, the duelist is half strength, half dexterity. So who would have guessed he starts exactly in the middle between those? The Templar is kind of strength, kind of intelligence, and the shadow is kind of intelligence, kind of dexterity. And to end it all out in the middle, you will see the Scion, which is all attributes at the same time. Now, remember when I said follow a build guide, this is probably the biggest reason why a build guide will show you and plan it out for you how you should path on this tree. Otherwise, it's going to be quite intimidating. I will go through the absolute basics, but once again, I will reiterate, if you follow a build guide, that is a huge boon for you. Now, I'm currently on my level 97 Ranger, and I just unspecced all the points, so this is a complete blank slate. I will show you how the, just the basics go. All right, so the first level you get, you can allocate into one of these points right here. Pretty simple. Let's say we go with projectile damage, right? What I did right here is I control clicked. 
However, what you can do as well is just click and then say apply points, which is probably the better way to do it. Otherwise, you might misclick early and refunding passives can be a little bit difficult at the start. All you really need to know is that the more levels you get, the more you can progress. For example, let's say I'm a bow character and I'm going to go through these points. Projectile damage, attack speed, projectile speed, projectile damage, right? You can hover over all of these and see what they do. I can't go through all of them, but I'll just show you an example. You're probably not going to do that. You're probably going to go through here. There's some attack speed, accuracy, go through movement speed, cool stuff, right? So everything that you want in this game, whether it be damage, defenses, movement speed, attack speed, is on this passive trait. So you can customize your character however you want. You can path to the other side of the tree and all of a sudden take melee notes. The world is your oyster. In total, you can have up to 123 points. So there is a lot you can do. Now, since this is a beginner guide, I want to inform you that the number one mistake new players make is not take life notes. We're going to talk about resistances, life, all of that later. But you can't just take damage notes and expect not to die in this game. This is not that kind of game. Things are going to check you. You're not going to... I don't know, weave through all the projectiles or whatever. Stuff's gonna hit you. You have to get life, especially early, and you have to look at your gear. But besides that, something else you have to know is you can refund passives up here. Now, to go back to this very intimidating tap right here, these are called Orb of Regrets. You can find them randomly within the world, and they give you a refund point. So as you can see right now, here I have 36 refund points. I right-click it, now I have 37. You can also get these refund points, I think, 20 in total through the acts i think you can get two refund points from quests in every act so 20 total yeah so that also helps now there's also a search bar up here so for example if i type in projectile right all of the nodes that are kind of projectile based will light up and if you zoom out here you will see them all right everything that kind of has to do with what you want to do for example you're up here you're a mage or like a witch, and you type in fire. You want to be fire-based, you see, oh, up here, there's something interesting. Let's see what that does, right? Oh, over here, there's something interesting. Or you can type in, for example, spell. You will see, oh, there's something there. Cast speed, right? Whatever you want. And once again, notice when I said earlier that attributes are not as important as in some of the other games. You're not going to path out here. What you want is damage. What you want is life actual stats right these attributes are only important if you actually need them to equip your items and that usually functions with items right you can for example have an amulet that just gives you 30 strength and stuff like that also at certain crossroads there will be stuff like plus 40 strength plus 40 intelligence way better than these pathing notes right so the reason these are called pathing notes is because mostly you don't want to take them unless you have to get somewhere, right? You will see them everywhere. We're now in the dexterity section, so they're all basically dexterity, almost all of them, right? If you go on the left here, you will see that most of them are strength, and obviously up here, most of them will be intelligence. Unless you have to get somewhere, you don't just randomly take these. I actually made a full article on this one over on Max Roll. Basically going over the skill tree, everything I'm talking about right now. Here's the graphic, right? The way you can see it. A very, very important thing to understand is the different kind of nodes. As it says right here, this here is called a passive skill cluster. You will see them kind of clustered in. This is a cluster. This is a cluster. This is a cluster, right? And these have different components. So for example, if we take this cluster right here, the small node gives you chance to impale. These are like called small nodes, right? They are not just attributes. They actually do something, but they're not really strong, right? They're okay, but you just kind of want to get to the big node, right? So for example, you have two small nodes here that you have to take, right? In order to get up here to the big node. And this is called a notable. For example, here you can see this small node here only gave you 10% chance to impale. This gives you 10% chance to impale. 10% increased impale effect, and then also another effect, right? So these nodes are big power spikes. For example, it doesn't fit into the build, but I just pathed from all the way up down here to the cluster we just talked about, and I'm now going to take the nodes. One thing you will have noticed, right, is that in the middle, something lighted up right here, and this is called a mastery. These masteries are kind of specializations of whatever cluster you just picked. So for example, you just took stuff that relates to impale. 
So the mastery is also going to be impaled. And now you can allocate one more point, if you have, to get any of these masteries that you want. So let's, for example, say I want the increased effect of impales. Okay, apply points. Now you have the mastery locked in. There is more of these passive clusters, though, that revolve around impale. So what happens if you get to another one? Can you only have one mastery? No, you can have as many as you want. For example, I just passed over here just for an example to the next impale cluster, Merciless Skewering. And we're now just going to take it and it lights up in the middle again. You can take another impale mastery, but you cannot take the same one twice. Now, why are these masteries so important and why is it so important to point this out? That is because, for example, there is a fire mastery down here, right? If you're in the Marauder Duelist area, but it is also up here if you're in the Witch area. So completely somewhere else, right? Explosive impact. That is a fire mastery. This is a fire mastery. But no matter where you are on the tree, you can take the same effects, the same masteries, whether you're down here and you're a Duelist or you're a Witch up there. This basically just gives you even more customization options. Okay, so we now know small nodes. We know notables we know the masteries there's two more things to talk about the first one is keystones as an example we can take versatile combatant right here this still costs only one point as always everything just costs one point but what you need to know about keystones is they have usually high upside high downside they are very specialized and usually unless your build guide tells you to take a keystone you shouldn't just randomly take them most egregious example of this is chaos inoculation up here maximum life becomes one but you're immune to chaos damage which is terrible for most people but the reason this exists is if you have energy shield you can set your life to one and you can have a ton of energy shield protecting your one life. It doesn't really matter. And poison and chaos damage can't get through your shield because you're immune. But if you're a new player, you just, what the hell is going on here, right? Another egregious example would be blood magic, which removes all your mana. You get a little bit more life, obviously, but your skills now cost life instead of mana, which sounds good unless you realize how auras work, which we're also going to talk about later, and you just screwed your build for no reason. So yeah, be careful with these keystones, right? There is one more thing to explain, and that is jewel sockets. Now, jewel sockets are made for jewels. Jewels are craftable items, so basically itemized effects. Think about like a one point here that you could craft and customize yourself. That's basically a jewel. And they're usually really strong if crafted correctly. So you can see right here, damage, cold damage, burning damage. So this is kind of a nonsensical jewel, but you can craft it to your wishes if you know how to. There is also cluster jewels, which will extend your passive tree further, but that is way down the line. Just know that jewels are an awesome part of Path of Exile, just a little bit too complicated for the start. Next up, let's talk about flasks. There are, in general, three different types of flasks. There is the life flask, the mana flask, and then certain utility flasks. There's also hybrid flasks, but for the sake of this video, they're not really that important. I will just leave them out, actually. Life flasks recover life over a certain period. So you see, for example, here, it recovers a certain amount of life over three seconds. And it also consumes charges. So the way this works is whenever you kill enemies or after certain boss stages, you actually refill your flasks. And that is because these flasks are not consumables. They're actually items. So if we go back here, you can actually craft your flasks and they do certain things, right? For example, here, I gave it mods that give it extra charges back and it removes curses. You can see these as more items. You can see it as the same as, for example, your helmet or something. So life flasks gives you life back whenever you kill monsters your charges fill up again so you kind of have to like make do with what you got the same thing goes for mana recovers mana over a certain period and then the most interesting one are the utility flasks whereas both the life flask and the mana flask are reactive you lose hp you fill it back up utility flasks are kind of like buffs which makes them kind of proactive so for example this quicksilver flask which is one of the strongest you want to get as early as possible gives you increased movement speed while its effect is up now whereas your life flask stops whenever you're at full hp and your mana flask stops whenever you're at full mana your utility flask just keeps going and there is a ton of these there is for example the jade flask which gives you extra evasion rating there is the diamond flask, which gives you increased critical strike chance, a lot of it. And there is even unique flask, like for example, the taste of hate, 
or the progenesis. Neat thing to know while you're leveling, you can actually upgrade your life flask. For example, here I have three greater life flasks. They are the same tier of flasks. Now, if I sell them to a vendor, you will actually get the next tier, in this case, a grand life flask. Now, let's quickly talk about auras here. Um, they are special skill gems that give you passive buffs while they're equipped and activated. But as you can see, my mana currently is full. If I equip Zealotry and I activate it, right, what happens is I reserve a certain percentage of my mana. Reserved mana is basically just unusable, so if I cast something, it will never go above the reservation mark. Auras can be incredibly strong, and the way most good builds are set up is you reserve as much mana as you possibly can, and then just use the rest of the mana that you have, and you just get a lot of regeneration or mana leech or anything of that sort. Some builds even make it so they reserve all of their mana and then they use something like life tap support to make it so their mana cost is converted to a life cost. For example, like here, you can still cast your stuff. Now, since these auras reserve a percentage of your mana, increasing your mana doesn't really work, right? Even if I had 2000 mana right here, it would still be 100% of reservation. However, there is a certain stat that helps here, which is increased mana reservation efficiency. This makes it so your auras reserve less mana. So if I take, for example, this wheel right here, you will see that now all of a sudden, I have some mana left to cast my stuff again. However, there is also auras that only reserve flat mana. So basically not percentage, just like a certain amount of mana. For example, Vitality here, Reservation 28 mana. This goes up the higher you level it, as does the effect of the aura. So very often, if you allocate all your auras and you have some mana left at the end, you can try and fit in one of these auras as well. And the more mana you have, the less of an impact these auras will make. So for example, I put on Vitality, you can barely see the reservation if I put in a level one. You can also reserve your life if you use the arrogance support with the aura. I would only do this if you know what you're doing and your build requires you to go for it, right? It can, for example, set you up to low life, which certain abilities work with that. So for example, this is usually a 35% reservation. With the arrogance support, you can see it now reserves 77% of my life, which is pretty damn rough. Then let's talk about all the currency that I can show you right now. There's obviously end game currency, which you will need in the end game systems that I will leave out right here. But everything that you can drop from the get go, basically, and just find and explore, we're going to talk about here. The scroll of wisdom identifies items. You don't know what it does. You click on it. Now you know what it does. The portal scroll pretty easy, gives you a portal. Now there's also a gem that does this, but the gem is not instant. The enkindling orb gives a flask a certain effect with a pretty big downside. For example, gains no charges during effect. This is mostly for like bosses or something like that. Whereas the instilling orb can also apply an enchantment. And this is used to automate your flask. So you don't have to constantly press them. For example, here used when charges reach full. Then we have the quality currencies, which is blacksmith, whetstone, armor, scraps, glass bars, bubble, gem cutters, prism. These all apply quality to certain items, more on quality later. As well as that, we have the cartographer's chisel. This is for end game, however. Then we have some of the crafting currencies. The orb of transmutation, when applied to an item, gets it from normal to magic. Once it's magic, you can apply the Orb of Alteration, which now re-rolls what's on there. So for example, if I do this a few times, there are different mods that appear. And then right here, you have the Orb of Augmentation, which if, for example, there's only one mod on your magic item, you can add a second one. These down here are just shards. 20 of those convert to one of the real currency. After that, we have the Orb of Annulment. This removes a random mod. This might not make much sense to you, but is a very, very comfy tool while crafting later. Then we have the Orb of Chance, which isn't that often used. It basically upgrades a normal item to random rarity. So you have a chance theoretically to get a certain unique item, but that's very, very low. But it's usually just too random to actually craft with, right? Then we have the Orb of Alchemy, really important. This one turns a normal item into a rare item with between four and six mods. Once you turn it rare, you can apply the currently main trading currency, the Chaos Orb. This reforges a rare item with completely new modifiers, so all of them will be reshuffled. On that note, you can also turn a magic item into a rare item. For example, right here, if I make a magic item with two mods, you can use a Regal Orb and turn it from magic to rare, 
which however will only add one mod so you will be left with a rare with three mods we then have the veiled chaos orb which basically just reforges your item with a veil mod more on that a little bit later then we have the divine orb which is another main trading currency next to the chaos orb very sought after item very rare and this one randomizes the numeric values of an item so for example if i press alt i can see all the way on the bottom 8 to 10 attack speed you can see i rolled a 9 and i can redo that but it redoes all of them so for example here i actually got a worse result with eight percent and this also works on unique items for example i can see right here i obviously wouldn't divine this usually 80 to 100 maximum life if i apply a divine orb now it went down to 90 but you can improve your unique items as well thing to note here you usually don't use divine orbs for this very very rarely you use it for a certain thing on the crafting bench that's not relevant for now but just know if you sell a divine orb and you get between 100 and 200 chaos orbs for that you can buy some hefty upgrades for your build then we have the socket and link items right here we have the jeweler's orb which influences how many sockets you have so for example you have two right now now you have four but you could also go less so on this weapon i could roll this until i had six but your sockets are not always linked and this is where the orb of fusing comes in for example i have a chance to connect all of them but it's completely random in this case i got it and if you're not happy with your colors you use the chromatic orb which is random once again but as i talked about earlier is dependent on what your base item is this one has a requirement of 182 strength so it very much skews towards red sockets let's use it here i got one blue back to three red one green but usually you will get rid. And then something that's really nice to find, especially while leveling, is the Orb of Binding. Upgrades a normal item to a rare item with four sockets. So we have a normal item here. Boom, now we have four and we turned it into rare. Then we have one of the most important currencies for later once you learn crafting, which is the Orb of Scouring. It completely removes everything from an item. So for example, if I make this rare and I don't like what I'm seeing, I can turn it back to normal and then reapply other currencies. It's just really important to kind of forge and get exactly what you want for you at the start though completely irrelevant talking about completely irrelevant we have to talk about sacred orbs this is one of the rarest currencies in the game just so you know it's three times rarer than a divine orb but that doesn't mean that it's more valuable in fact it is just kind of useless it does very very little it randomizes the numeric values of base defenses on an armor so if I press alt right here, you can see all the way up there, evasion rating 264, and it's like in brackets, right? The base value can be adjusted with this. It is completely negligible. Just forget it exists. If you find it, sell it. Then we have the blessed orb, which influences implicits. So we already said, for example, here, there's an implicit, but it has no role, right? It's always 45 increased stun duration, but some implicits have a range. For example, this chaos resistance here, 13 to 17 for me that is right now 16 but i can apply some of these blessed orbs and all the way at the end we have the val orb right at the end of the video i'm going to talk about corruptions just so you know this completely randomizes whatever is on the item it can turn it into something good it could give it new mods stuff like that we're going to talk about that later in this case nothing really happened but it got the corrupt attack actually no we did get a white socket my bad we did get a white socket so not really relevant but just so you know that's one of the outcomes so corrupt attack means i can't corrupt it again right it tells me right here target is corrupted and it means i can't use certain things on the item anymore but there's also exceptions to that just know that vol orbs you shouldn't really use early until you know what you're doing with them otherwise you could just break your items this is a good time to talk about quality quality is kind of everywhere you find these kind of armor scraps and blacksmith whetstones glass blowers bubbles right what the hell are those what does quality even mean one important thing that i want to tell you about is early especially these qualities on like armors and weapons are not that important on weapons they can be but you can also vendor them for scrolls of wisdom if you need any. Same goes for armor scraps right here. As well as that, if you find any of those, also the orb of transmutations sell for four each. But besides the point, what does quality do? Well, on weapons, it increases your physical damage by a percentage. So for example, 5% quality increases your damage by 5%. So you will see the number that was right up there is now actually enhanced and it goes up the more I apply. Important to note though, if I do this on a magic item, it doesn't give me five quality per click. It only gives me two quality 
or blacksmith whetstone that goes for all of these and if the item is rare or unique it will actually only be one percent all right so blacksmith whetstones for weapons and then we have armor scraps for body armor helmet gloves and boots and they increase whatever you have on there for example if you have evasion it increases your evasion armor now the glass borers bubbles is for flask quality and on life and mana flask it increases the life or mana recovered as you can see right here while on utility flasks it increases the duration of the flask and then we have the gem cutters prisms which are the rarest of these quality currencies and they increase the quality of a gem always only by one percent and if you don't know what the quality of a gem does you can press alt and down here we'll say additional effects from quality up to 10 percent increased damage and the quality maximum is always 20 so as you can see right here one percent two percent and it goes on the increased fire damage right here cool thing to note is there's actually a vendor recipe to get 20 quality but for that you have to have a level 20 gem so all the way leveled up to max and sell it with a gem cutter's prism and what you get is now it's all the way down to level one but you get 20 quality now then you have the crafting bench if you don't know where to get this one and it's not just in your hideout normally which it should be you go to decorations and you can find it here and place it wherever you want the crafting bench is an incredibly strong tool that lets you add a mod to one of your items so for example if i have these gloves right here and i'm like oh i need some fire resistance i go right here as you can see, I can augment this. It will cost you a certain amount of currency and there's different tiers depending on your level. You unlock these crafting recipes throughout the campaign and also later in maps. There's also some special crafts, which we'll get to way later. But in general, this is here to augment your items. Throughout the campaign, this is very important to get your resistances fixed. But as well as that, a thing you can also do is get extra stats. So let's say you're playing on the left side of the tree. You have a lot of strength and intelligence, but one of your gems needs dexterity. Well, don't worry. For a very low cost, you can actually get dexterity on here. One more thing to note here. If you want to override a mod that you already have on an item, on top of the crafting costs, there's also an extra orb of scouring that you have to pay. Now, in general, these mods are worse than the ones you could get on items. They're kind of like substitutes, right? But the crafting bench is still incredibly, incredibly strong, especially throughout the campaign. But even later, even some of the strongest items in the game will finish with a crafted mod. Now, then let's talk about your subclass or your ascendancy. In Act 3, in the main town, if you go up here you will get access to the Asberens Plaza. Now, in order to get access to that plaza and do your labyrinth and get your ascendancy, you have to first do certain side quests, so to speak, certain lab trials. I don't have it up here anymore, but whenever you're in a zone where there is a trial, it will say complete the labyrinth trial. Now, this is an example of a trial. If I go in here, there's like traps and I kind of have to do like... I have to push these levers, right? Right now, I'm obviously completely out leveled so it's going to be whatever uh, but later you might encounter like something harder important to know as you just saw here even though i'm like i'm almost level 100 character and this is a monster level 8 zone these traps actually do percentage damage so you got to be careful about that always bring a life flask then you click on here and you completed one of the trials you do this six times and then you can start your first labyrinth now where you get those trials should be right here if you click on it it should tell you where on the mini map to go as well as that, once you have unlocked it, you can go up here to the activation device. And if you hover over here, it will tell you, it even tells you in which act it is. Now, the first labyrinth that you do, you choose your ascendancy. So without spoiling anything that's going on within the labyrinth, I'm now at the end right here. And you can see a few things. Up here, you have the divine font. This is where you can get an enchant for your gloves, for your boots, for your helmet. That's something that concerns you for later. Then there are these chests, which depending on how you do the labyrinth, you will get a certain amount of treasure keys to open them. For example, I can open three different ones. My loot filter is pretty rough. If I look at here, this is obviously the lowest tier lab, so there's not going to be that many rewards. These get pretty crazy if you do the higher tier ones. If I had to give any other tips before going in here, bring a lot of life flasks and also you can't die otherwise you have to redo it all over again but what we are really here for is to get our subclass and that you get back here at the altar of ascendancy i already chose my ascendancy but this is where you choose it for example i am a dead eye and you can see right here wherever your starting point is there's going to be like a small arrow where you can open your ascendancy tree you will see i have in total one two three four 
five, six, seven, eight points allocated. And there's four different labs. Every lab gives you two points. If you want to change these points later, it doesn't just cost you one regret point or one refund point up here. It costs you five, as you can see right here. I get minus five. Let's just unspec this here real quickly so I can show you stuff. So for example, you just did your first lab. You can now take one of these, right? So you have two points. For example, let's go for far shot. Doesn't really matter. Okay, cool. Now, if you later want to change your ascendancy class, you can. You don't have to make a new character. All you have to do is this has to be completely respect, right? So you can have no points into this, right? Then you complete one of these labyrinths. It doesn't matter which. And you go to the altar while having no points allocated. And now I can click change down here. You can see I can click change down here. And I could theoretically now go into Raider or Pathfinder. All right, so you just unlocked your first lab. You're back here. You can, for example, do a higher lab. Now, it even tells you what the recommended level is. Personally, if you're a new player, I would add plus five to that usually. But you do you. You can try it out. If you're in softcore, if you die, just try again, right? But after that, the Cruel Labyrinth, next two points that you get for your uh, Ascendancy Passive Tree. Merciless Lab. After that, another two points. So in total, you will have six. And the hardest one is down here, the Eternal Labyrinth. For this one, you need a special entry token that is called Offering to the Goddess. But those you will get way, way later in maps and endgames, so you don't have to worry about it right now. The Templar's Ascendancies are the Guardian, the Hierophant, and the Inquisitor. The Guardian is pretty much a support kind of class that has really good defenses, but is not used all that much. Some people also use it for minions. The Hierophant is sort of your caster, but instead of using your own spells, you put it on totems, which are sort of these turrets that you put down that use the spells for you. And then you have the Inquisitor, which is your typical critical strikes elemental, either spellcaster or attack based build. It also has this kind of hybrid theme in there. The Shadow's Ascendancies are the Assassin, the Saboteur, and the Trickster. The Assassin is pretty straightforward as you would know it. It has a lot of damage. It's kind of fast, right? And you also have effects where it gets stronger if you only have one enemy, so to say, with the Assassin theme. The Saboteur revolves around traps and mines, so sort of these contraptions that you put down. As well as that, you have certain triggers, so spells that you can trigger in various ways get even stronger. And the Trickster, I would just call an all-rounder. It basically does everything. It has recovery, it has damage, it has movement speed. It doesn't do anything really well, but it has it all. For the Marauder, we have the Berserker, the Juggernaut, and the Chieftain. The Berserker trades off defenses to deal even more damage. It's also very fast, very speedy. It has this mechanic with rage. On top of that, we have the Juggernaut, which is the exact opposite. It focuses on armor and just being incredibly tanky in general. It is what a lot of hardcore players love and a lot of softcore players loathe. And then also the Chieftain, which sort of has this fire theme. Once again, we go back to some totem stuff, but this time it's more attack focused. As I said earlier, the Scion is not that great for beginners, and that also has a reason. It only has one Ascendancy, and you can kind of pick and choose from whatever other class or other Ascendancies that you want. Choice is good, but in Path of Exile, that is going to be really hard to make work. So stay away from this one, but in general, very interesting class. On the Ranger, we have the Deadeye, the Raider, and the Pathfinder. The Deadeye is your truest bow class. It's all about ranged attacks. You get additional arrows. You get chains, projectiles that chain around on the screen. You're very fast. Really fun to play. Raider is also very fast, but it doesn't really have a ranged theme. You can go in basically any attack-based class it is very elusive very fast you can get phasing so you run through enemies and you also get to stack these frenzy charges which basically give you more damage and more speed and then also we have the pathfinder which for veterans of the game is one of the strongest classes it uses your flasks to get even stronger However, for a new player, this might be a problem. It also has a poison theme, so maybe if you want to go poison, you can take it. But in general, it is a little bit more complex, but it's one of those classes where you can get near immune. On the duelist, we have the champion, the slayer, and the gladiator. The champion is just an overall powerhouse. It is what a lot of hardcore players love because it's very defensive on the one side, but it also has speed and it has damage, so a really good all-rounder class in general. For beginners, I'd say it's mostly melee-based. Another melee-based class is the Slayer. The Slayer has really interesting mechanics where 
It plays around with leech, very, very strong leech mechanics for some crazy recovery. And it also has effects where it just straight up executes enemies. Especially if you have an AoE attack skill, this one is huge. And then we have the Gladiator, which is sort of this bleed theme. So one big hit that bleeds the enemy to death, as well as that it has really good support for block builds. The Witch gets the Elementalist, the Occultist, and the Necromancer. The Elementalist has a theme around ailments, so Ignite, Shock, Freeze, and Chill. It makes them even stronger, as well as that you get a lot of generic elemental damage and some elemental defenses. The Occultist is also kind of an all-rounder class for cold and chaos builds. It has a lot of generic damage. It also has interactions with curses, and it can also make enemies explode on kill, a path of exile favorite. And then the Necromancer is your stereotypical minion class. Doesn't mean that you have to go Necromancer, it just means it is kind of like a blueprint for it. And let's talk about damage. Damage is a little rough to understand. Here we will just go through the very, very basics. The biggest distinction here, once again, is do you have an attack or do you have a spell? Because they work quite differently, spells get their main damage from the gem. So if you see right here, fireball, right? We have our tags on top, level, the cost, and then you have a cast time. So that means every 0.75 seconds, you can cast this and you can increase this with cast time. For example, if you have 100% increased cast speed, that means you cast double as fast. You have a critical strike chance, which is basically your base critical strike chance. Whenever you get increases to that, for example, you have 6% critical strike chance and you get 100% from gear or whatever, that 6 will go to 12 because it doubles. Then we have effectiveness of added damage. We're going to talk about that later. But you can see down here, deals 9 to 14 fire damage. That is pretty clear cut, but let's make the comparison to, for example, an attack based skill. Round Slam. Okay, we see level, we see cost, we saw that before, but it has, first up, an attack speed and attack damage value. And if we look down, all the way down, there's no damage whatsoever here. So where does our damage come from? Well, it says attack speed and attack damage, and this is based off of your weapon. This is important to know because spells main damage comes from the gem, which means gem levels. Whenever you level up your fireball, it gets stronger and stronger. The highest level you can reach is level 21. Just look at the comparison. 9 to 14 and at level 21, 1845 to 2767. So you can see there's no weapon here involved. The weapon does absolutely nothing for spells other than get certain stats. We're going to go into that in a second. But the baseline damage that everything will get multiplied off of comes from gem levels. Whereas on the attack skill, we see attack speed and attack damage. Attack speed, 90% of base. What does that mean? Well, we have to look at, for example, a weapon right here, Ancient Sword. It says, one-handed sword, physical damage. Now, this is the base damage of your weapon that this attack damage will scale off of. So, for example, attack damage, it says 115% of base. You take 150% of that physical damage. You have a critical strike chance, which is basically the same as with this gem right here, just that on a spell, it says it on the gem. And it has attacks per second. And we saw here, attack speed 90% of base. So you take 90% of that 1.45 attacks per second. Which means that attack-based builds, percentage damage based off of your weapon. For attack-based builds, the weapon is incredibly important and should be upgraded constantly. You should be looking for a better weapon all the time. This means that, for example, for leveling, spell-based builds are way more lenient because you don't really have to find upgrades. You just level up your gems, which you do naturally. Whereas with attack-based builds, you have to have a little bit more of a plan. So that is important to note. Now, not every weapon is made equally. There is a huge array of different weapons, but just looking at one-handed swords, this one I bought from the Act 3 vendor, and this one I bought from the Act 9 vendor. If you see the difference here, there's a lot more physical damage on this one. Critical strike chance is the same. Attack speed is a little bit better, right? So you can already see that we have more than double the physical damage on this one. All right, so weapons can also have mods, though. Let's just see what we quickly get here. We just made this into a rare, and we see up here there's a new line which says elemental damage, and we now just added... 14 to 25 cold damage and 2 to 27 lightning damage. The rest is pretty unimportant. Does this scale with your spells? Still no. Now this, for example, is increased physical damage down here and added physical damage. You can see those stats, right? And you will see up there the physical damage adjusted. So 
The weapon adjusts to these stats. However, increased physical damage does not apply. For example, you have a physical spell. It does absolutely nothing. These stats are local, as we say it, to the weapon. And the weapon doesn't matter for spells. Now, these are the most important local stats that you can get. Added physical cold lightning fire cares, as we saw earlier, right? Adds a certain amount of lightning damage or cold damage, right? Increased physical damage, right? As we can see right here. Increased attack speed and increased critical strike chance. They all determine basically how good the weapon is and have nothing to do with spells. But here, once again, how important is the base type of the weapon? Incredibly important. Even with these two really good stats, we're barely getting at where this item is just baseline, right? So if we had these mods on this weapon, I mean, we would do like triple the damage. Now, the next question you might have is, what kind of weapons do spellcasters wield then? Well, you're not really going to find any spellcaster stats on these swords. However, you can find them on, for example, a wand or a staff or a rune dagger. These items roll completely different stats, right? So for example, if I look at the wand right here, it already starts off with 36% spell damage. And then if we make it rare real quickly, we will see right here, now that's different stats. The one to four fire damage is still a weapon mod, but... Down here, it says cold damage, two spells. Whenever it specifies two spells, if it doesn't specify that, just remember it's only for attack-based builds. Let's roll a little bit further if we can see something else. Now here you can see increased spell damage obviously works. Cold damage doesn't work, right? We roll further, we see added cold damage to spells, increased spell damage. Down here, if you would do like an ignite build, for example, the burning damage would actually count. That is obviously global. And then if you get something like projectile speed or cast speed, these do all work for your spells. The most sought after stats on, for example, a wand would be plus two level of a certain skill type. There is also plus to all spells, which is very rare, but there is, for example, plus one to level of all chaos spell skill gems or fire or lightning, right? So you have to get the right one and that will increase the damage of your skill significantly. But the probably most infamous thing about PUE damage is the difference between increased and more. And this is where a lot of people kind of lose the plot of how they can actually increase their damage. But this is super important. So I have to put it even in the beginner section. So for example, on the passive tree, you will see a lot of these things. Let's say you're projectile based build and you get 20% projectile damage here. 10% projectile damage here, 10 again, right? This adds up to a pretty big sum. Now, let's say you're level 80 and all your passives added up, right? Amount to 500% increased damage because you took a lot of these notes. What does that mean? That means they all add up to one number, right? So for example, I get 10, I get another 10, that's 20 and so on. In total, we have 500. Let's say our skill deals 100 damage, Pretty easy math, that comes out to 600 damage. All right, now what happens if, for example, I got another 60% increased damage from somewhere else, right? Let's say you, you were level 80 when this happened, and at level 84, you get a, something that says 60% increased damage. The important part is you're not multiplying this whole damage. You're just adding 60 here. So that would come out to now 660 damage. In total, if you go from 600 to 660, that's like getting 10% more damage, right? So the 60% increased damage sounds really good, but it really isn't. And that is because what you're seeing here is diminishing returns. That is the term that people call it in PoE. And that just means that the more increased damage, the more of these nodes you take, the worse they get relatively. Level one and two, you wanna get them all. They are incredible, but the higher up you go, the more you're looking for something like more damage, right? Something that multiplies all your damage. As an example, a really strong support gem awakened elemental damage with attacks. Supported attack skills deal 39% more elemental damage. And if you don't know the difference between more and increased, you're gonna be confused because this is a support gem that apparently has only 39, but for example, Divine Judgment does 50, but it's only increased, so it's not as good. Now, let's take this for example. We just said that these 60% increased damage didn't really do that much. They kind of just increased the damage by like 10% or something. Let's say 39% more damage. That is actually going to increase your damage by 39%. So we're back to square one, right? Where we were before. 100 damage, 500% increased damage, 600 damage. And this comes at the end. So what's happening here is you actually take the whole 600 times 1.39 
and you multiply it and you will see that's a lot higher than the number that we had before. So if you looked a little bit through the passive tree and you're confused why, for example, elemental overload, right? It deals 40% more elemental damage, but it has such crazy downsides that you have to overcome. Whereas this node is just 50% increased. That is because increased is just worse, right? Because it's not multiplicative. The more you get the worse it is. So what you're usually looking for is a healthy amount of increased damage. You'll get that from the passive tree, some gear pretty easily, usually, and every possible multiplier. If there's a multiplier that fits into your build, most likely you'll want to get it. All right, next let's get into defenses. We have a full guide over max roll where we go very, very into detail, but that's a little bit too overwhelming for this video. I'll give you the super basics, but if you want to check that out, I'll link it down in the description. Now, the first three big ones are the ones that you will see on gear, armor, evasion, and energy shield. Either you see one of them or a combination of them. Now, armor and evasion are not exactly easy to understand in terms of what they do. It's not like you have 10 armor, so you take 10 less damage or something. No. Both are a little bit more complicated. All you have to know is armor reduces physical damage and physical damage only. Armor is very efficient at mitigating small hits and gets worse the bigger the enemy hit is. For example, you have a certain amount of armor and an enemy hit is 100, that might mean you're actually reducing half of it. Whereas if a singular hit is bigger, that might just reduce it by 30%. The second one is evasion, and it has another one of these calculations that are pretty hard to gauge. For example, on this character right here on the character sheet, you can see I have an evasion rating of 25,634. If I activate my Jade Flask, you will see it actually goes up to 37,000. And there's also an estimated chance to evade enemy attacks. And as you can see here, if my Flask is not up, that's 75%. And if I activate my flask, that is 81%. You can also only evade attacks. Little thing about evasion that you have to know is it uses entropy, which means, for example, I have 75% chance to evade. It's not just like random, right? It's, it's not like I could get hit four times in a row because I'm just getting that unlucky 25%. No, it uses entropy. And that means you don't really get unlucky. It has a system where... If you just got hit twice in a row, it's super likely that you're going to evade the next attack. And then we have energy shield, which is this thing over your health bar, right? For example, here it says shield 47. Whenever you take damage, unless it is chaos damage, that damage will first be taken from your energy shield. If it's chaos damage, your energy shield is completely useless. One nice thing about energy shield is that it recovers naturally after two seconds of not getting hit. However, there's actually notes on the passive tree that make that even faster. For example, if we look at this cluster right here, 20% faster start of energy shield recharge, which would mean instead of two seconds, that would be starting in 1.8 seconds. And once it is recharging, you can also reduce the time it takes by taking nodes like these with increased energy shield recharge rate. However, and this is really important for new players, energy shield is the most gear dependent out of all of them. You will need incredible gear to make it work, so don't just jump into it thinking you're going to be an energy shield build, especially if it's one of your first characters. Both armor and evasion give you a lot more upside from the get-go. Resistances are important enough that I want to speak about it right here and now. You need to get as much resistance as you can get. The game is balanced around you being at resistance cap, which naturally is 75%. Resistances reduce the incoming damage of whatever element it protects. So for example, fire resistance, somebody hits you with fire, cold, lightning, same thing. There's also chaos resistance, same thing. These also work against ailments. For example, fire works against ignites and chaos works against poisons. So let's see how resistances work. They're quite straightforward. If you, for example, take 100 fire damage, that will go against your fire resistance. If you have zero resistance or even negative resistance, that's even worse. We're going to go into that. You take 100 damage straight up. You take that damage. But if you have 75% resistance, which is your cap in this case, you only take 25. That is one fourth of the damage. And it is not that hard to get these resistances. You can get up to 48 from just one singular mod on one of your items. So it's not like easy there's always like a thing where you have to think about it but it is always always worth it there's no situations where you will not keep your resistances as soon as possible now, obviously during campaign that is pretty hard to do so don't worry about it too much but the higher in acts you go the more the enemies will hit for so the more resistance you will want and once you get into end game and you finish the campaign you want to be at at least 70%. If you're on hardcore, you need to be capped. Now, while fire, cold, and lightning, super important, chaos is a little bit less necessary, although that changed over time quite a bit. But for example, you can see on this character, I only have 23 
100% Chaos Resistance, but if I press my Flask, I go up to 58, but I am not capped, and that is okay, especially early, because you're going to be struggling. Chaos Res is a little bit harder to get than the other ones. You will actually go negative during the campaign, though, if you're not careful, because after the Act 5 and after the Act 10 boss, you will lose 30% all resistances. So if you have no items, you start at 0, minus 30, Act 5, you're at minus 30. And then after Act 10, you're at minus 60. So you have to make that up as well. Now, where do you get the resistances from? You find them randomly, right? But you can also look for jewelry. Rings have implicitly, just like whatever you craft on it, that mod is always going to stay. They have resistances. And on top of that, if you want to be even safer, you can also look from Act 3 onwards for the Purity of Elements Aura. This scales up to, I think, 30-something elemental resistances, right? It starts at 20, and it also makes you immune to elemental ailments. So that is Ignite, Shock, Chill, and Freeze. Now, there's another way to understand defenses, though, which is mitigation, avoidance, and recovery. Mitigation would be you stack something like armor resistances, which makes it so you take less damage from hits. Or you could say, well, I'll just stack something like evasion, which makes it so I don't take damage in the first place. The problem being that if you get hit and you have no mitigation, you'll take a lot more damage. And then once a hit comes through and you take damage, how do you recover that life back? So let's look at some of the other defenses you can get, which aren't like main defenses, but they're still incredibly, incredibly strong and important. You have to think about those. The first one is spell suppression. And this one is mostly on the right side of the passive tree. You will find them. And it says here, chance to suppress spell damage. Whenever you suppress spell damage, you only take half the damage from the hit. It obviously only works on spell hits. But for example, if you had 100% chance to suppress spell damage, so you always suppress it, you only take half damage. Since spells are incredibly deadly, especially against some of the bosses, a highly sought after stat. Second, we have block. You find block more on the left side of the passive tree, sort of in the strength and intelligence area. And there is stuff that gives you chance to block spell damage and chance to block attack damage. So for example here, chance to block spell damage while holding a shield or staff. And this is similar to evasion because if you block a hit, you don't take any damage from it. If you evade a hit, you don't take any damage. But there's two distinctions here. The first one is that you can still get stunned if you get hit and it's actually completely random there's no entropy there if you have 75 chance to block you could still get hit five times in a row at least if you are unlucky also block is kept at 75 percent whereas evade chance is kept at 95. we then have fortify which is sort of a way to help for melee builds to get a little bit tankier because they always have to be in the face of enemies there is a fortify cluster right here and a fortify cluster here you get this from a support gem. You can also get it from the champion ascendancy. Fortify has a stack amount of 20 and you can increase this with certain nodes. And for each one fortification that you have, you take 1% reduced damage. You also have physical damage reduction, right? Which could be stuff like endurance charges, for example. These give you 4% physical damage reduction. Whereas armor has sort of like a weird equation. This is just straight up 4%, right? If you take 100 damage, you only take 96 kind of thing. Then there is Fizz as Ellie or physical taken as elemental damage, which is a very strong stat. For example, on the Taste of Hate right here, 15% of physical damage from hits are taken as cold damage instead. The reason that is so strong is because physical damage has no resistance, but cold damage does have resistance. So whenever you get hit, it now gets reduced by your resistance. And then we have some ways to recover. So we talked about these things. There's mitigation, there's avoidance, but there's also recovery. Let's say you get hit, you need to get back up to full. So yeah, you're actually tanky, right? There is life leech first up. This is mostly relevant for attack-based builds and leech is all over the place. You can type it in here. There's also mana leech, which makes your sustain a lot easier. But for example, here we have vitality void, Leech is a very, very delicate thing, but just know that the more damage you deal, the more you're going to leech back. And there is a cap to how much life you can leech back, which is 20% just basic, and you can increase that with certain effects all the way up to like 40 or more. There's also this keystone right here, which doubles your total recovery, but makes it so life regeneration is completely useless. Then we have life regeneration, which is mostly found on the left side of the tree. And all this does is pretty straightforward. Regenerate a certain percentage of your life per second. There's also effects that isn't percentage based, but like flat, for example, it says regenerate 100 life per second. The vitality aura comes to mind. Then we have life recoup, which is a little bit more fringe. I wouldn't usually take this unless you have a build that revolves around it. And that just basically means you get a certain amount of damage that you take 
recouped back over a certain period of time, in this case, four seconds. And especially as a new player, the most important recovery is going to come from your life flask. Use them often, upgrade them, they're incredibly strong. Next up, let's go over ailments. These are important because they might affect your build, as well as that enemies also deal these ailments to you. So understanding what they do means you know, should you avoid them with some kind of effect or not. Now, there are elemental ailments and the others, non-elemental ailments, right? There is an ailment for each one of these types of damage. So for example, fire has ignite, shock has lightning, and chill and freeze belongs to cold, which are technically two different ailments. Non-elemental types, so for example, chaos has poison and physical has bleed. Starting on top, ignite deals fire damage over time. However, only your biggest hit counts towards your ignite. So this is a very strong ailment for builds that just hit once but hard but very bad for builds that hit multiple times in general being immune to ignite is decent but not required the second one is shock this makes it so enemies take more damage so if enemies apply this to you then you take more damage which is quite quite rough so you would like to have some form of shock immunity. On softcore, I would say you can get away with not having it, but on hardcore, no shock. And then we have chill and freeze, the cold ailments, which basically slow enemies, with threes slowing them to basically 0% movement speed, which is different to stunning them, but it basically makes them unable to move or you unable to move as well. However, if you just chilled, then enemies can just chill you up to like 30% reduced action speed. In general, being chill immune is a nice side effect, especially if you want to go fast. It is not required, but it's very nice to have. And freeze is the only ailment here that I would say you have to be immune to on literally every build. There's also alternative ailments, which you don't have to know about right now. That's very, very end game ish And then we have the non-elemental ailments, which first up is poison, which deals chaos damage over time. Important to note here that unlike ignite, this stacks infinitely. You can have a thousand poisons of enemies and all will deal damage. So this is a great effect for builds that have a lot of hits, for example. However, that does not mean that you have to get a lot of hits, right? Because theoretically, whether you have 10 poisons that deal 10 damage each would be the same as one big poison with 100 damage, right? So you don't get any bonus for stacking them. And then you have bleed, which is a physical damage over time. And it is incredibly similar to Ignite. The durations are a little bit different, but nothing to write home about. Bleed is just basically the physical version. However, the one thing that does distinguish them is that bleeding targets take increased damage if enemies are moving. So that also counts for you. If you're bleeding, you want to stand still. And on enemies, that means if you have something like knockback that counts as moving for the enemy, or if he's moving anyways, you deal more damage. Now, the easiest way to gain elemental ailment immunity is actually purity of elements it gives you all res and then immunity so that means ignite shock chill and freeze are gone from the equation as well as that alternative ailments but in general it is hard to justify this because it takes 50 percent mana reservation as you can see right here and there's a lot of good other auras but if you need freeze immunity that is a big thing and then we also have pantheons which we're going to explain in the mapping section where you can get a 100% chance to avoid being frozen. This is also a mod that you can craft on boots. Now, if you're following a build guide, almost every build guide has immunity to freeze somewhere, but just something to think about. Now, after initial struggles, you will get through the campaign and you will be in Path of Exile's endgame, which after everything I said, how hard the game is to get into, you're now at the beautiful part of the game. This is what Path of Exile absolutely excels at and it really shows. You have so many things to do and I will explain to you the most basic things that you need to know in order to be equipped for that. Just understand that there is a ton to do here and it doesn't really get much easier in Endgame. However, at this point, you're already accustomed to learning a lot of new things and you already picked up on a lot of stuff. So everything will make a lot more sense. While there is a ton of things to do, the main Endgame activity that GGG or Path of Exile wants you to play or steers you towards is the Atlas of Worlds with its vast mapping system. After completing the campaign, you will have access to a new region, which is the Epilogue. If you go here, you can see you're at the Kurui Shores and you will meet Commander Kirak. And he will give you one of these as a quest reward, which is a map. Now, what are maps? 
Maps are basically itemized versions of a region that you can put into a so-called map device right here, activate, and we'll open six portals to that region. So if I enter right here, I will get to that region. Every one of these has its distinct layout, right? Mobs that you kill along the way, the whole shabam that you already know about, and then at the end, there is a boss. So for example, I just did the whole map. There are 49 monsters remaining because I'm not yet at the boss, but just to show it to you, this is the whole layout of the bone crypt that I just cleared. And if we go to the boss here right now, obviously my character is completely overgeared for a tier one map, but yeah, that was the boss or whatever is left of it. And yeah, if you do this for the first time, you're unlocking map completions, which will become important in a second. But for now, all you need to know is you don't need to full clear this map. You can also rush to the boss if you really want to. But there's obviously stuff dropping along the way, including more maps to complete more stuff. Important to know is you can get Command Akirek to your hideout. There will be an option right here to invite him there. So once you get to your hideout, you will see him over there. So you don't need to go into the epilogue anymore. You will also be able to get your own map device, which you can get right here at the decorations. And there will be a map device somewhere and you can just put it wherever you want. Now, in order to explain maps to you, though, I need to show you the Atlas of Worlds right now. We'll go over everything that you need to know. But in general, what you have to understand is we just started here, for example, right? That's Colonnade. We did a Bone Crypt, right? So you start right here. It doesn't really matter. Basically, it's a web of maps that just connect to each other. And whenever you kill a boss you have a high chance to get a map next to it. So for example, when killing the Bone Crypt map boss, I had a chance to get a grotto or a silo, but you don't always get it. However, the mobs on the way, the enemies on the way can also drop them. Now, what you need to know is there's tiers on maps. We just did a tier one map. They get harder and harder by quite a bit. Tier one goes obviously to tier two and so forth. And you see these like white maps is what they're called. They're tier one to tier five. And once we transcend to yellow maps, we have tier sixes. Tier six up to tier 10 is called the yellow maps. And then once we're in tier 11, which goes all the way up to tier 16s up here, that is red maps. Now, you can actually craft maps though, because right now there's nothing on my map. I can make it magic, right? It gets special mods. I can make it rare. It gets even more mods and even progressively harder. And I can also corrupt it if I want to. Now, we're just going to leave this rare map right here to explain what just happened. I just introduced difficulty to this map in order to gain, as you can see up here, item quantity, item rarity, and monster pack size. Monster pack size just means you get more monsters and everything else is just more items on the ground and then rarer items on the ground. However, as a trade-off for that, I got some pretty nasty map mods. Players cannot inflict exposure, increased monster damage, yada, yada, yada. There's a lot of these mods and it depends on what build you run, which of these you would want to avoid. And since you can reforge these items, you can also just put a chaos orb on and get new modifiers. However, the quantity, rarity, and monster pack size will adjust depending on how hard your mods are. Also, don't forget that you can quality your maps. However, you should always do that when the map is white. There's nothing on it yet, right? Because then you get once again five per the quality goes up to 20. However, I would not do that early in the game at all. That is something you need to save for later for red maps, for more difficult maps. Now, why is it important to craft your maps? That is for a few reasons. Obviously, you want more rewards. That's a good idea. And then also the bonus, right? The kill bonus on the map bosses. For white maps, you need to kill magic or higher versions of the map. For yellow maps, you need to kill a rare version. So the one I just showed you with a lot of mobs off the map. And if you want to get the completions for red maps, you need to kill a corrupted rare version. Now, when corrupting a map, there is a ton of outcomes, which is too much right now. Just know that they're basically going to get more difficult. You can get up to like eight different mods on your maps. This is not something I would do until you are in red maps and you actually have to do it. It can get quite difficult. One map mod you will want to avoid like the plague though is reflect. So right here in the second line, it says monsters reflect percentage of physical damage. This can also be elemental damage. Now, if you're a chaos-based character, this does nothing to you. But just understand that you don't just take a little bit of damage. If you're a physical character and you have this on your map, you're one-shotting yourself immediately. However, once you are at least in yellow maps, I would basically Orb of Alchemy all your maps so you can get rares and get more items. And whenever you have to map complete it, you will see this outline right here. 
and down below you will see this counter for example i have all maps completed out of 115 in between there's also unique maps which have their unique layouts they're very unique let's just put it that way all right fair enough so you get completion of the map what else do you get when you complete a map you get an atlas skill passive point that you can put into this huge web yes this is going to be a theme in power exile they love skill trees now going in depth on the skill tree is very hard because it depends on what you want to do but just so you know what this is and what these nodes do is they basically give you more loot for specific things that you do in a map they can give you more maps they can make it so you're faster. They can completely derail your maps into something very weird. All you have to know for now is that whenever you complete a map, you get a point to spend into this tree. And almost all of these nodes are themed around certain mechanics, league mechanics, which I will explain later if you want to watch that part. For example, here you get an additional harbinger. If you don't know what that means, that's fine. There is stuff like harvest with the sacred grove. These are all things that you're going to learned little by little there's also refund points up here so if you have any decisions that you regret you can undo them just know that they are harder to get than on the passive tree itself now on the left side here we have the favorite system this is basically once you have unlocked most of the atlas so these will get unlocked over time by you completing all maps by you completing like unique maps by you completing certain bosses once again no spoilers and then you will unlock them over time what these do is basically, let's say I really like the Coves map right here. If I put it in here, that means it's more likely that I will drop this map versus other maps. This lets me kind of customize my endgame to run more maps that I want to run and less of the maps that I don't want to run. Then we have down here the Void Stones, which get socketed in right here. And what these do is basically increase the tier of all of the maps on the Atlas. So obviously, the maps that are already tier 16 will stay the same. But the more Void Stones you have, the more you can make maps down here into higher tier maps. Which is pretty cool. Because if you have, for example, a tier 3 map that you really like to run, you can increase its difficulty to up to tier 16. You can unlock these by killing extremely strong enemies and bosses later. If you hover over here, it will tell you which of these bosses they are. Then we have these three things up here that might look weird to you. We'll start with the Maven progress right here. Maven is one of the three big baddies in the game right now. One of the big endgame bosses that is quite hard to do. And in order to get to her, you have to do certain invitations. Now it tells you here exactly which maps you have to complete. Some of these are unique maps you will get way, way, way later. As always, check the wiki for certain things if you don't know where to get them. This is way down the line, way in red maps. Maybe even like once you absolutely stomp red maps, right? But basically, what this is, is you capture certain bosses. And later, you will fight them all at once in one arena. So this would be an example of that. As you can see, there is these monsters frozen. And all of these are particular bosses that are pretty hard for new players to do and then later you're being asked to kill them all at once which can turn into some pretty epic fights and once you cleared all of that you will get an invitation to maven now the under other two ones are the new baddies right the ones that got released after maven and that is on the one hand the searing exarch and on the other hand the eater of worlds now all of these have quest lines throughout completing maps so whenever there is an npc Talk to them and you will at some point get more progression towards that quest. Also on the top right here, if you haven't completed them yet, there will be instructions on what to do in order to get to these bosses. One more thing on the Maven stuff, by the way, if you capture one of these bosses of normal maps, this is how it will look like. So don't freak out if your map all of a sudden turns like this. And then on the right side, we have these things right here. So these are master missions is what they're called. And the masters are Kirak, Jun, Nico, Alva, and Einhar. You can invite these into your hideout once you complete them, either during the campaign or maybe later in maps. If you follow the quest lines, you're going to get them throughout the campaign already. Always invite them into your hideout and then you can interact with them. For example, let's take Jun here, which is one of the masters. What does it do to get a mission from her, basically? Well, if you click on Atlas mission, you will see that you can now summon Jun in that map. So if I put this map right here and I open it, I would encounter Jun in there, which is basically like a quest, right? In terms of these quests, 
Jun, Nico, Alva, Einhar do something unique. However, what Kirek does is he basically gives you a free map. So if I look at Atlas mission, you can see right here, I can choose between one of these already pre-made maps that he wants to give me. Now, when I hover over these maps, down here it will say collect mods, assembles for Tane. So once again, an instruction for the map and then construct and slay the metamorph, which means you get an extra metamorph in this map. You don't need to know what that means, but just know that these maps are enhanced. However, these maps are not affected by your Atlas passive skill tree. So while these are cool, getting free maps, later you will swim in maps and it's not going to be that great and you would rather have the extra juice from the Atlas passive tree. But for now, especially for early, this is invaluable. You can also, as you can see here, get unique maps. On the topic of Kirak, if we look at here, he has an inventory. Now, there's a lot of vendors in the game, but he's a little bit special. He sells you maps. Let me put myself to the right side a little bit. He sells maps, which once again can have special mods. It's not that important. Just know that if you click Alt, it will tell you whether this map is already completed or not, as you can see up here. And so it can help you fill out your Atlas if you don't drop certain maps so you don't have to trade, or at least not trade with other people. Here you can see Orb of Unmaking. This is how you respec points on the Atlas passive skill tree. So for example, if I buy one here, it costs two regrets, which are the respects for the normal passive tree. If I click one, you can see right here that instead of 14 refund points, now I have 15. So I gave you a brief overview here, but obviously it could happen that you have problems progressing through the Atlas, right? So I'll give you some actionable tips. Make your maps rare. This quantity right here that you get, the item quantity also counts for map drops, which means you'll get more new maps if you make your maps before harder. So unless your character feels too weak and you have to run them, for example, magic, I would definitely save your Orb of Alchemies for your maps. You can also, by the way, use Orb of Bindings. Second thing, use Kirek whenever you can. This guy is your best friend. Either through purchasing it here, these cost Orb of Chances early and later they will cost Orb of Alchemy. So once again, Orb of Alchemy should be going into that and same thing for chance orbs. And then Kirak, once again, also gives you these missions. So if you're lucky enough to receive some of those, use them. A big one is the Atlas passive tree. I obviously can't give you an overview of our, all of this mess, right? Uh, but I will point you to some very, very strong things to, that you can do early to drop more maps. These small nodes will help out a lot. You get 2% chance for a connected map to drop in a map which is huge if you stack it up over time. There's a lot of these small points. Everything else will depend. Do you follow an Atlas guide? Do you want to do it yourself? What do you like to play? But a thing that I would definitely say, if, unless you're following a guide, stay away from keystones. There's a lot of these things. For example, singular focus looks maybe good to you, but just understand that these can completely break your Atlas. Stay away from stuff like that and shadow shaping and definitely wandering path if you don't know what you're doing. And then at the end here, you can trade maps with other people unless you're in soul self found, just trade them, right? That is a completely normal thing that most people do on League Start because it is kind of RNG which maps you get. And sometimes you're like stuck and you're like, okay, I'm now tier nine, I can't progress. You go to trade, you buy three, four maps, and you're back in the game. Might be wondering, okay, that was kind of complex, but is that really that big of an end game? Well, we barely scratched the surface, and I cannot put more in this video. I'll just give you a little bit of a hint at how big the end game in Path of Exile actually is. Inside this Atlas passive tree, there are so many specializations on how you want to set up your maps and how you want to farm certain currencies. And all of them are unique in a way and all of them let you specialize in a way. But even aside from maps, you can completely ignore maps and do certain other things. For example, you can completely focus on bossing. You can make a character that's very slow, but it has a lot of defense and it can just tank everything or it can just one shot the bosses. You farm boss uniques and then you sell it to other players that want those boss uniques for their builds. You can do blight maps, which are different kind of maps. They're sort of like tower defense style maps. You can do lab farming. Remember the one where you unlocked your ascendancy? There's harder versions of that that are incredibly hard to do that some people specialize in. You can go deep delving, which is even crazier. You can do heist, which we're going to talk about. 
you can magic find so stack a lot of quantity and rarity on your gear i probably missed like 10 of these but on top of that if you don't even want to play the game you can just sit in your hideout and craft all day if you know what you're doing you craft items that people want you sell them and yeah you get a ton of currency in fact some of the richest people in the game are crafters you can also just play the economy you can buy items low and sell them high this right here is the magic of have of exile this is something that you cannot grasp when you first play this game even once you get into end game and you start doing maps and you maybe trade for your first items you have no idea how far this goes especially in terms of crafting and like trading it is something that fascinated me about this game always and something that for some people will be irreplaceable in any other game. So if I could give you a piece of advice, uh, once you're in endgame, you're kind of confused. Everything is just being thrown at you and you don't know what to do. Find stuff that you enjoy first. Then try and specialize in that and get better at it. For example, I don't know. You're like, I want to learn how to heist. And I'm just going to do that for like a month or something. And then you're like, okay, let's move on to the next thing. And then maybe the next thing you don't like. And you're like, okay, let's move on to something else. Even people with tens of thousands of hours in this game do not know everything. It is simply impossible. Usually people have certain things that they love and they do that. Now chapter three, league mechanics. What are those? They're basically content drops. Every three to four months, there is a new challenge league, which will include a certain league mechanic that we haven't seen before. For example, there's this weird monolith all of a sudden in one in every zone and if you click on it weird stuff happens right these kind of things expand the game and what happens very often is after that league is over these get implemented into the main game so you can imagine just how much content there is for a game that's like a decade old quite a bit now not all of them get implemented and we're only talking about the ones that are still in the game and that are relevant to you in this video i will also not go too deep into it just so you know whenever you see something like that Oh, what happens when I click this monolith? If you're just looking for something specific, these will be in alphabetical order. Let's go through it. All right, so I'm in a map right now, and there's this weird thing on the ground. It's like a green dot on my mini map. Let's run over it. This is called an abyss. Once I step over it, it's going to release monsters, and there's going to be a lot of rares down here. This is the first stage, for example. It stays here for a little bit. Obviously, this is a lot harder whenever you're going to do it. I have a completely decked out character, right? Don't ask about it. But um, it has certain stages. And for example, here it only went to the second stage. Now, if it stops and there's a portal, you know you just summoned a boss. If that happens, you'll get some cool-ass items. But otherwise, you will just open this chest right here. And one of the things that is very unique for Abyss are Abyss Jewels. And these are basically just different to normal jewels that they have different mods. They have a lot of flat damage, as we call it. This one's actually pretty damn good, I just realized which is kind of funny, but yeah, just different kind of jewels. Now, important to know is you can actually socket them into your items because there are specific unique items that you drop from these abyss bosses. If you get a portal that have these sockets in there and you can't put gems in there, but you can put these abyssal jewels in there. However, if that is not the case, you can still also put them into any jewel socket as normal. Then we have ambush league, which introduced strong boxes. All this really does is, I mean, you can unID it if you want to see the mods but basically when you open it there's going to be mobs and then there's a reward very old league and you will see kind of a pattern that the newer leagues are getting more and more complicated the old ones were kind of like this then we have anarchy league which introduced rogue exiles it's very bare bones it doesn't have anything interesting going on in terms of loot or anything like that if you see like human-ish characters inside your map that just jump at you and do a little bit tankier than usual that's rogue exiles they're not going to drop anything particular this definitely needs a rework and is just very, very old. All right, the next, sometimes you're going to have Einhar in your map, right? Which is one of the masters. And that is whenever you have beasts in your map. So let's just go through here real quickly. You will see these weird icons on your mini map once again. The mini map is really, really important when you look at league mechanics. So for example, this is a beast up here. It will come down. These are just harder rares basically with special abilities. And whenever you bring them down to a certain point, Einhar will catch them and you will get a loot explosion. There is red beasts and yellow beasts. Red beasts give you certain crafts and yellow beasts are just there to be consumed by those crafts. If you don't get Einhar randomly, you can also go to him in your hideout and click on the Atlas mission and you will actually get him. Once you did this, I think first time you get him in Act 2 actually, so you should already know who he is. Uh, you can go to the menagerie on your waypoint right here. And if you go 
up there so there he is right and if you go up here there is the blood altar and you will see there's a ton of crafts to choose from but besides making your items better you can also have stuff like for example getting a unique item ring amulet belt so this is especially cool if you're like early into the campaign and you find one of these red beasts also on the side pretty cool you can actually go in here and uh, see all of the beasts that you caught right here then we have betrayal so sometimes in your map you will get assassinated by enemies or they will just show up right so for example on this map i put jun on you can see i can go down to this laboratory and i can do certain things and it wants me to uh complete this mission um so there is a target in here that i have to quickly do obviously this can get a little bit harder these are like bosses that you have to complete now if i click on one of these guys after i completed it you will see this board right here and whoa i can just tell you right now you don't want to mess with this i can't put this into this video how this actually works just know that you can kind of manipulate the relationships between these members they're all part of a certain syndicate there's a boss at the end. It's a cool mini game. That's all you need to know for now. Now, Jun is also one of the masters in your hideout, as you can see right here. So you can also get Atlas missions from her. One of the coolest things that she give you, though, even if you don't want to engage with that mini game at all, is these veiled items. If you bring them to her, you can actually unveil them right here. And that will give you a permanent buff on your crafting bench. So, for example, if I choose cold and chaos resistance, that is not usually a stat that you can get on an item. But if I get it and then you later go to the crafting bench, you can actually add that mod to any other existing item. Then we have the Beyond League. Beyond monsters have kind of been castrated over time. They're now basically relegated to a map mod. Slaying enemies close together can attract monsters from beyond. If you have that on your map, you know you're going to get those mobs. You can also get a boss. You will definitely notice it once you see it. And what Beyond gives you nowadays is down here, if you go to your stash tab or you just find them randomly, you see exotic right here there is these tainted currencies and these let you influence corrupted items right so usually you can't do that on corrupted items but for example a tainted orb of fusing randomly either adds another link or removes another link from a corrupted item tainted jeweler orbs tainted chromatic orbs they're all right here these are very useful and especially early in the league worth quite a bit then you have blight so if you see sister cassia right here with the ichor pump basically this is like a mini tower defense game you can kind of like build stuff here if you want to right you can also complete these mobs uh, immediately and once you kill them all the monsters that are kind of running at you you get certain rewards with the most important one being these oils right so they have different rarities and what you can do with them is actually anoint your amulet that's how it's called anoint item you put this in here and then you will see down here you will actually get certain effects. So for example, here I'm getting efficient explosives. If you're wondering what that is, that is a node on the passive skill tree, right? So for example, you can see right here, efficient explosives. That is the node up here. You can see it's allocated even though I didn't even path there. That's an annoyance. And if you're wondering, you can actually hover over and then press alt and the game will tell you which oils you need in order to get that annoyance. Oh, and there's also blighted maps, which you can drop, which give you a map. But instead, it's like a huge tower defense mission. That's how you can think about it. You get some rewards at the end and it's complete chaos. Another thing you can find inside of maps are these hands right here that you see on the mini map. If you step over it, a breach opens. What is this? This is basically just a ton of mobs coming out from the underworld or whatever. And there's different kind of breaches. One for each ailment, right? For um, There's one for physical, one for chaos, and then lightning, fire, cold. This one is a Chaos one, a Chayula one. This is also the rarest one. Um, so you can see you're kind of dropping these splinters. If you collect 100 of these splinters, you get access to a so-called Breach Stone. And these Breach Stones then open a portal to another area where you can fight a certain boss. Once you beat that boss, you have a chance to get a Blessing. For example, here in one of these Xoth Breaches, I can now use that Blessing to upgrade the Breach Stone to a higher tier. Now I have a Flawless Breach Stone. That's an even harder boss with even better loot. Then we have Delirium. So sometimes within your map, you will see this mirror at the start, right? It would kind of like lance at you. If you go through it, now this is rough. You're now going to face Delirium monsters. And the more you kill, actually, you can't even see this. Let's hope I don't die. Um, we put over there. You can see down here, there's like a reward box here, right? 
And these are basically different rewards that you can earn for killing monsters while you're in here, right? So, yeah, you kill more mobs, you can see it fills up. And at three, you get even more rewards, right? And it goes so on and so on and so on. The further you're away from the mirror that you originally opened, right, in meters, the harder it gets. So, for example, some maps that are very long and not, like, circular will get a lot harder. And I'm talking a lot harder. Enemies get damage reduction and extra damage here. And once you've finished everything, you're left with this right here. So, a few things about loot here is you can get delirium orbs basically if you place these on maps you can guarantee that that map is going to be delirious which once again makes it a lot harder as well as that you can also get cluster jewels which basically extend your passive trees these are a little bit too complicated for this video then we have delve which is a little bit more complex once again doesn't fit into this video your mine encampment you can go right here you will see nico down there he has like an inventory with stuff there's crafting methods that you can use. You can enter the Azred mine. And then if you press V, you will see you can just grind down here, right? You can get all of these rewards. There's different reward tiles. The further you go down, the more rewarding it will get and the more difficult as well. In order to even travel down there, though, you need to fuel the machine with these Voltaxic Sulfide Veins. So if you ever wondered what these are inside maps, that's what they do. So you basically have this gameplay cycle of you have to farm sulfite to uh, get deeper and deeper and get more and more rewards. And once again, Nico is one of the masters that you can invite into your hideout. So if you have Atlas missions for him, you get those sulfite veins for free. Then we have Domination, which is just basically these shrines that got introduced into the game. Very old league. There's nothing else to it. Then we have the Essence League. If you ever wondered what these things are, these are basically like frozen enemies and you can release them if you click on them three times and they will give you these itemized things called essences. And these are basically just crafting currency. For example, if you look at what it does, it tells you if you put this on a one-handed weapon, it will guarantee one of these mods, right? Damage penetrates 5% cold resistance, right? If you put it on a two-handed weapon, it's something else, right? And depending on what essence you have, it can have different effects. Look out for these, especially during campaign, because they also make the item rare. So even if it's like a mod that you don't necessarily want, it's still better than having to wear like a normal or a blue item. Next up, the Expedition League. It's very hard to miss this one. Down here, you can see toggle explosive placements. There's a lot of stuff here stuck in the ground. These are like the big boy enemies that you kind of want to kill. These make the encounter harder whenever you explode it. All you have to do is basically place your explosives. I will do this right here. One, two, three, four, five, right? And once you press detonate explosives, the chain will begin, now it will release monsters, and depending on what I chose, what I exploded, uh, there's obviously, once again, a little bit of things to know about this, but you're basically, you're getting different items, you're getting rewards. One of these rewards could be vendor currency. What do these vendors do? Well, first up, the vendors are Danig, Gwenon, Rog, and Tujin, and they let you do different things. For example, Tujin lets you haggle for certain currency items, which can be incredibly strong, and down here, if you have one of these vendor currencies, you can re-roll the options right here. So then you would get a new assortment of currencies to choose from. Rog lets you craft certain items. Gwenon lets you gamble for uniques. And Danik sells you certain things like, for example, logbooks, right? You can also find these in maps and expeditions. And logbooks are just basically huge maps that just have like 20 plus explosives and let me tell you there's a lot of loot in there now then we have harbingers which i'll just show real quickly a harbinger is this like blue man right here kind of like this alien type we don't know much about them basically you just kill the monsters he summons he's invulnerable but the more monsters you kill the more down his hp will go and he drops certain currencies there's some unique currencies here that you can't get anywhere else but otherwise, he just drops these currency shards. And that's basically it. They never really expanded upon this league. And we have Harvest, which is quite huge. The Sacred Grove, if you see this inside your map, on the mini-map, it will look like this bluish icon. You go in there, and you see there's these plots. So there's always two next to each other, and you can choose one of them, and they have different enemies in them. So for example, I just click this. Boom, and now I'll wait for the, for the monsters to be released. I kill those monsters. And while killing those monsters, they will drop crystallized life force. There's three different types of life force tied to the different colors. So there's yellow, 
violet which we just killed and there's also blue if you did this for the first time you will get access to the horny crafting station and it's amply named because it's basically another crafting thing and for the life force that you just found you can do certain things which are pretty damn cool for example you can reroll an item and you're basically guaranteed a cold modifier lightning physical you know what you're doing with crafting these are incredibly strong but even if you don't they can definitely help out your build early now, another mini game is heist which was one of these pretty big leaks actually that a lot of people <laughs> didn't like for various reasons but if you click on a rogue marker you find this you right click it you will get teleported to the rogue harbor and well here you're basically following a storyline the tldr is you're basically a thief and uh you want to recover some things you get items if you follow it long enough, you get even better items. At some points, you're not just doing these contracts. You're doing whole blueprints, which is just a whole array of stashes, a whole array of loot. It's a lot to learn, a lot to take in. This is something that, for example, a lot of people specialize in. It's very rarely that somebody just does this on a whim. However, especially if you're starting out, this can be a good source of currency because it's very easy and accessible once you start doing it. So you go to Adaya here, you say prepare heist. Let's say you're like level 60 and you find one of those in like blood aqueducts while you're campaigning, right? You just go in here and yeah, once you enter it, there's going to be loot in there. There's going to be chests in there. Just follow the instructions. But to give you a little bit of context, this is how it looks like. So you come into this zone, right? And you're basically there to, I don't know, just rob all of these chests. There's an alert level down here. The more you loot, the higher this will go. And at some point all the stuff will close. And at the end here, there's an artifact that you want to steal. That's about it. Now, you might've noticed that some of these gems are glowing. And if you're wondering where these are coming from, they are from heists. So for example here, phantasmal blink arrow. What this means is it has a different quality than a normal blink arrow. If you press alt, you will see this gives you extra cooldown uses, whereas the normal blink arrow has a different effect. And these exist for every gem in the game. So have fun min maxing. Then we have incursion league, which introduced Ava, another one of the masters. If you click on her, you will see this temple right here. So this is basically... You can make connections here between these rooms. You can level up the rooms. TLDR, it's basically build your own temple that you can then loot. Now down here, you will see 12 incursions remaining. So you build this temple in 12 steps. Whenever you see here, you can just basically influence whatever you get. It's a tempest to the temple, increases the rarity, blah, blah, blah. Enter incursion. And once you're in there... You can do a few things. You just have to kill mobs real quickly. And it's basically timed, right? So the time will go up and you will find these items, stones of passages, right? So for example, I can open the workshop right here and now it connects me to the workshop once I have completed this. Uh, completing, I mean, you can go out whenever you want, right? You can find more uh, stones of passage. Uh, once you go out, you will have kind of like a mini loot explosion right here from Alva. And if I click on here now, there is now going to be a connection to the workshop. You do this 12 times, you loot the temple, you kill the boss at the end. Now then we have Legion. So if you ever see this monolith, frozen, once you press on it, there will be a whole lot of frozen enemies. You have a certain amount of time to break them free. If I click on this, for example, you will see what happens. Now, what's happening here is there's two sides fighting each other, right? Two different armies, and you have to free them both, and afterwards they attack you. There's different kinds. Uh, you're also breaking free these uh, like boxes, these uh, chests. And if you open them, you get the loot. Uh, you have to kill these mobs in order to free them and then loot them. If you do not kill them in time, then you don't get their loot. This is a mechanic that really rewards fast characters. It's an incredibly rewarding mechanic. And one of the things it drops is these splinters. And once again, we have a situation where if you get 100 of these splinters, you will get an emblem. What is an emblem? Well, it's basically another portal. However, you have to combine emblems together to open a certain zone. So you will notice right here on my map device that I have five spaces. How do you unlock five spaces? With these emblems. Usually if you have four at the start, you put in four of these emblems and now you're getting into a certain zone, the domain of timeless conflict. And once you clear this zone, this is basically like a five minute timed event, once you clear this zone, you will unlock your fifth map device slot. And once you have your fifth emblem slot, you can do five of these emblems at once. Next up, Metamorph. Did you ever wonder why there's these green things over your mobs? Well, you have a Metamorph in your map. You can see it down here, Spawn Metamorph Vial. We're going to do that in a second. 
But before that, you want to kill as many mobs as possible with this green thing over it, right? So, boom. We just kill all of them. That's cool. The most important one is the boss. So, you go to the boss. You kill the boss. And after you killed him, you can summon the metamorph file. Now, this is Tane. And he lets you construct a metamorph. So, out of the parts that you just farmed from those monsters, you can now build a construct. So Down here, you will see Glace's liver. This is a unique part from the unique boss that we just killed, and the rest are just going to be rare, magic, whatever. There are these icons over it, which give you different rewards. You build your metamorph. Now we'll one-shot it, but just understand that these are usually incredibly hard, especially early. So if you don't have the character fit, don't be discouraged. It is pretty hard content. And as you will see right here, now I get an itemized liver. And now you can go up here to Tane's laboratory, and I will not go too in-depth here. But if you see down here, you can actually construct the metamorph. So out of these unique parts, you can now build a super unique boss, right? Once again, uh, just going over the top. Now, what does this league mechanic actually drop? Well, there's a ton of loot, but the one distinct loot are these catalysts. They give quality to jewelry. So for example, if you look over here, you can see my moonstone ring actually has quality and that doesn't work with normal currency, right? You can only do that with these catalysts and each catalyst amplifies a certain type of mods. For example, on this one right here, I have attribute modifiers. So dexterity, intelligence, and if there was strength on it, strength as well would be increased. Now then we have rituals. As you can see right here, if you get one of these ritual altars, that's how you look on the mini map, kind of these yellowy things, and you click on it, well, now you're kind of like enclosed in this space and you have to kill all of these monsters that are getting released. The more monsters you killed around this altar, the more it will release. It basically sucks up the blood of all the monsters around it. Once I cleared all the rituals, which in this case was four, it says down here, four to four, uh, you just click here. And now the more mobs you kill, the more tribute you will get. Basically, the more mobs that will be sucked up by the ritual items sometimes. And now you can turn that into normal items. Sometimes there's divination cards. In this case, we got uniques. And we have Sanctum, which I can't really show you right now because it's going to be reintroduced next league. It's another one of those mini games. It's supposed to be Path of Exile's versions of a roguelike. But other than that, we don't really know much about it. I actually really like Sanctum. I hope they don't rework it too much. We'll see. And then we have Synthesis, which isn't really in the game as a mechanic anymore. However, the crafting has been very much changed ever since it got introduced for two reasons. The first one is fractured items. If you look at the color of my mods, you can see that one of them is kind of like goldenish, brownish. The plus six run to accuracy. And this basically just means that whatever I put on this item, that mod is always going to stay there. So you can roll, roll, roll for whatever mods you want. This mod is never going to disappear. And the second one is synthesized items. So for example, this ring right here, a moonstone ring usually has plus 25 to energy shield in the implicit up top. But as you can see, I have a wild arrangement here. I have three different implicits. Strength, intelligence, global crit multi, you don't need to know more about this. Synthesis is basically a very, very convoluted and old crafting system. Just know that it makes items usually better. And we have Talisman League, one of the worst leagues of all time. The only thing left are the amulets, the talismans, which now just randomly drop from other stuff. All they have is a different implicit, completely useless league. Forget it exists. Speaking about useless, tormented spirits in Torment League were introduced they're basically supposed to be these ghosts that go into enemies and make them stronger and then they drop more loot. And whenever they touch an enemy, it gets like a flame over it and gets stronger. It is extremely bad and completely outdated. And it just doesn't really fit into Path of Exile because often you're killing mobs off screen. So you can't really like place them correctly. Yeah, and that's just a bummer, but it was a leak. Now to conclude this section... How do you get these mechanics? Well, either you get them randomly or you get them on the Atlas passive tree. There's a lot of these effects. For example, we talked about ritual where this says additional chance to have ritual altars, right? Additional chance to have a smuggler's cache, which gives you contracts. Additional chance to get a mirror of delirium. You can also take one of these notes. This basically makes it so you can get no breaches, but all the other content has more chance. So you can kind of specialize. Same goes for abyss and whatnot. But probably the easiest way is through Scarabs. Scarabs let you customize your map even more. And for example, when you put in a map, you can put in as many Scarabs as can fit in. 
For example, here I can put in up to four, right? Because I have the space for it. And now if I open this, I will get an additional breach, an additional metamorph, three strong boxes, and an additional abyss. Pretty cool stuff. And there's also different tiers of scarabs. So for example, those were rusted, but there's also polished and then also gilded and they get better and better, but also more and more expensive. Now, how does the monetization work in this game? Well, it is technically not pay to win. You cannot buy any power. Everything you buy in this game is either cosmetic or quality of life. What you can, however, buy is quality of life stuff. For example, stash tabs. Now, depending on who you ask, stash tabs are either pay to win or not. In my personal opinion, it falls more under the convenience stuff. But I will say this, if you're a trader, you'll want a lot of these stash tabs. And the more you have, the better, because you can just throw stuff in there and then trade stuff, sure. But overall, I think Path of Exiles model is just absolutely awesome. You can't buy any sort of power. Now there's cosmetics, right? Like bundles, you can change how your skills look, which is what I honestly put most of my money into whenever I want to support them. You can hype up your portals, right? The ones where you portal out of your map can look different and whatnot. There's a lot of cool stuff here. I guess if I had to say one egregious thing, it would be the mystery boxes. Even though it is just cosmetic, it's still gambling. I don't like to get people hooked on that stuff. It's $5 per try. Not really for me. Now, in general, if people ask me, what should I buy as a new player? Let's say you played the game throughout the campaign and you're like, I want to drop $20, $30. What do I buy? Well, the most important thing is if you buy points to buy anything, right? You should never buy up top, right? Don't buy these straight up coins. Go down and purchase one of the supporter packs. There's a $30, a $60, and a $90 version usually. Sometimes there's bigger versions. Depends. All you need to know is if you buy this, you basically get these cosmetics for free. $30 for 300 points, $20 for 200 points. You, you kind of just get them on top of whatever is here. If you ask me what to do with your points, definitely buy stash tabs. I usually say the first 40 to 60 hours maybe are free. And after that, you should be buying stash tabs because you're going to be full everywhere. Most important thing to know, this is kind of like a tier list of which tabs I would personally buy. You can screenshot it if you want to. Just my personal opinion. The one thing you need, though, is a premium stash tab. It costs 15 coins, which is like $1.50. And what this does is basically the four stash tabs that you get for free, you can upgrade. And then you basically can trade in those tabs. So if you go to one of these premium tabs and you right click up here, it will say public. And if you make it public, you can price stuff in here, right? So now if I right click this life tab support, I can price it for a certain amount. Now, going over the must-haves, I would say down here, first up is the currency tab. You will need it a lot. All your currency goes in here. That's how it looks like. The map tab, which we already looked at. That's where all your maps go in. Then you have the fragment tab. There's so many different mechanics with so many different fragments. It will save you a ton of space. And then on top of that, you also have quad tabs, which are these times four tabs. So a normal tab just for comparison, is only this big. And this is how big a quad tab is. This is really nice to have like an overview over your items. And I would definitely recommend buying at least one of those. Now, some more important things about stash tabs. First up, use the affinity system. If you right click up here, you can see a whole slew of affinities right here. It says Blight, Currency, Delve, Essence, and what's not. What does this do? Well, it helps you a lot with inventory management. For example, I go to my currency tab, I right click, and I have affinity currency right here. What does this mean? No matter in what tab I currently am, if I control click it into my stash tab, it won't show up in this tab. It will automatically go into wherever my affinity is at. And you can do the same thing for fragments right here. You can do the same thing for maps and so on. However, if you don't want that to happen, you control shift click and then you can overwrite the affinity for just a second. Second thing, use the free tabs from decorations. If you go down here on decorations, you will see there is some stashes here. There's, for example, your guild stash, but there's also the expedition locker and there will be the heist locker. If you open them, they can hold stuff like logbooks or certain currencies, right? And heist locker, you can store a ton of contracts and a lot of blueprints, especially if you're like free to play or close to free to play and you don't want to drop much money, use those to your advantage. Plus, they also have an affinity down here. And the third thing is 
there's stashed up sales every three-ish weeks. It depends what the leak cycles are. Sometimes it's every two weeks. Sometimes it's every month. But in general, stuff will be off by up to like 30%. Something you definitely want is a loot filter. They filter out all the trash that is on the ground whenever you play Path of Exile. And frankly speaking, the default filter that you get from the game itself is embarrassing. So as always, a third party will have to fix that. In this case, NeverSync. For that, we need to go to filterblade.xyz. And you need to first sign in with your Path of Exile account. Everything is a reputable part of the PvE community, so you do not have to worry about that. Once we signed in, you have to authorize, right? And once you're signed in, I obviously already have a lot of these filters, but I'll show you how to set up your own. So if you want to customize your colors, uh, how the drop sounds are, a video down below in the description where I talk a little bit more in depth about loot filters, but you just want to play the game, right? So what you do is you go here. There's different strictnesses. Basically, the higher you go, the more stuff will be hidden. So if you're a very experienced player, you're going to be in, in this region right here. But for the start, I wouldn't really go higher than semi-strict. You then go to save and export. And now that you have logged in, I'll, for example, name this new player. I'm on PC. You don't have to do anything else. You can make it public or not, whatever you want. Sync or download. And then you can do save and sync. And what happens now is basically the filter will be visible in game. And you find that in your options here under game, you go to item filter, and then you click on it. And as you can see here, I have a lot of things. One of them is new player. Now, if you do not see your filter right here, you can try sync, you can try relogging. Sometimes it takes like five minutes, but it is very easy to use. And when it comes to optimal settings, these really depend. But if you go escape options, I can give you a little bit of advice. When it comes to graphic settings, I don't really know what your specs are, so I can't really help you that much. Uh, try maybe capping FPS if you're having in-game uh, problems. You can play around with the renderer here, DirectX 12, 11, Vulkan. Some people have very different experiences with them. The only thing here I would definitely recommend is put down Bloom to as low as possible. The Bloom basically makes everything a lot more shiny, as you can see on the screen. And it's just very, very tiring on the eyes. But that's just my opinion. If you want to fiddle around with that, go for it. On the game settings, once again, here's the item filter that I talked about earlier, which is basically mandatory, honestly. Other than that, there's nothing really that interesting here. I guess auto-equip whenever you pick something up would be nice, especially for a new player. And then we get to the UI. Now, these are, once again, preferential. The only things I would definitely change are visual sensitivity, at least for me, I hate screen shake. Incursion ultimatum effect can be kind of dizzying for some people. Uh, so would also disable that, but you can also leave it on and get back to it later. And camera rotations effects are very rare in the game, but I just don't feel like they're necessary. Then you can play around with your overlay map transparency. If you click tab, you can always have it up top if you want that, but you can also have the overlay map. With your arrow keys, you can get them left, right, left, right, whatever you want. And you can play around with this. Landscape transparency basically just means that the landscapes around it are activated. It looks a lot fancier, but it's also less useful, I think. It can distract you. And then map transparency is basically how much do you see of it. If it's on zero, you don't see it at all. And if you go full ham, it might actually distract you. I usually have it somewhere around here. And map zoom is pretty self-explanatory as well. Now, when it comes to items, definitely enable always show sockets. This will look a little bit more ugly to you at the start, because now you see those sockets all the time. But trust me, in terms of usability, it is just so much better. Make sure that show full description is enabled. And then also gem utility pop-up, I think, is on anyways. Show life and mana levels. That basically just means that this will be shown at all times, which I think is very important to know where you are. And I also enabled show mini life bar on allies and enemies. I really hate if I don't know how low my enemies go. You can customize your mouse cursor here. There's also some bigger ones in the shop. And down here, you should probably disable trade chat. There is just no reason to ever be in trade chat. As well as that global, if you are recording especially, there could be some naughty words in there. Basically, if you open your chat with enter, you can do that up here as well, though, at any time. You can enable, disable global, enable, disable trade. Next up, Pantheons. These you can open with the Y key and they are mostly defensive buffs that you can change to adapt to your situation. You can have one big one and one small one allocated at any time. However, you can only change them when in town. So for example, Soul of the Brian King gives me a lot of good stuff, but I'm like, I'd rather have Soul of Lunaris. Then I click on Soul of Lunaris and it's done. You don't have to accept anything. 
Uh, there is a big pantheon up top that you can choose from four options. And then there are some small ones down here. The way you first unlock these is through the acts. Some of them are, however, in side quests and not in the main quest. So make sure you pick those up as well. When you first unlock them, you will only get the top most effects. So for example, I get physical damage reduction and I get increased movement speed. However, over time, you unlock more layers. Once you unlock them, they show up blue like here. And the way you unlock them is by killing certain map bosses. So for example, I captured... Puruna the Challenger. These are referring to map bosses. So let's, for example, say I want to unlock the 10% chance to avoid projectiles. I have to kill and capture Sebert, right? So I go to my Atlas. I type in Sebert in the search. And down here, I guess you guys can see it down here, there is the Moon Temple map. So I get a Moon Temple map. And as well as that, you will need a Divine Vessel. This makes the boss a little bit harder, but it doesn't really matter. You can also just run it white. You even have to put mods on it. Uh, you put in the Moon Temple. You put in the frag right here, as you can see, and I just activate it. Now we found the boss in here. We're going to quickly kill him. All right, we killed the boss. And now whenever you foil out, whenever you're ready with completing the map, all you have to do is go to the map device and you will see in here, you captured the soul of Severed. Now you right click it and there you go. You have 10% chance to put projectiles. Now I would really go over these and see which ones fit your build and kind of like counter some of the weaknesses that you have. Uh, just some quickie tips. Soul of the Brian King. If you get the chance to avoid being frozen, that is huge. Every character should be freeze avoid and some builds just cannot get that. And as for small ones, Soul of Aberath is something a lot of people take. Burning ground can be really nasty, especially in end games once you unlock altars. So if you get the unaffected by burning ground, that's big as well. If you're having problems against chaos damage, Shakari can be very strong. Uh, Soul of Rislafa gives you a ton of life flask recovery in situations where you, you might run out of them. So for example, big bosses. But yeah, just try them out for yourselves and don't hesitate to adapt to your situation. Next up, let's talk about corruptions. Corruptions revolve around the Val Orb. If you corrupt an item, it can have several outcomes. For example, I corrupted right here. Something happened. We got an extra implicit level of socketed Warcry gems, just as an example. But what you have to notice is down there, it now says corrupted. This tag means I cannot normally modify this item anymore. It tells me the target is corrupted. Same thing goes for links and also sockets, anything of that nature, colors as well. So in a lot of ways, you can see this as a final step for an item, but not always. Often you don't want to corrupt your items. And that is the reason why if you're a new player, you should stay away from Vile Orbs for now. However, I will tell you what they do. First outcome is nothing happens. You still get the corrupted tag though, so you can't really modify it further and also get white sockets um if we do this a little bit further i'm sure we're going to find one yeah in this case we got a white socket uh, you can get full white sockets theoretically but it is incredibly rare a white socket basically just means that you can socket any gem into it any any color of gem the next outcome is that it just re-rolls the item completely into a rare item this also happens if you for example corrupt a unique item you could get unlucky and it could turn into a rare and you just lost a unique and the Outcome that most people want is actually the corruption implicit. I just showed you socket that Warcry gems get plus two levels. There's a lot of very sought after mods that people want. Usually the things that people corrupt are uniques because they are replaceable. If you have exactly a rare that you want. It's hard to get the same rare again, but uniques you can just buy corrupt by corrupt. This is especially done on cheap uniques to get exactly the modifier that you want. On maps, it gets a little bit more interesting. So in general, you should not corrupt your maps unless you're fine with making them a lot harder because there's a lot of stuff that can happen. First up, it could re-roll the map modifiers completely. So everything you have on there could be re-rolled and then it's corrupted so you can't change it anymore. So if there is a mod on it that you can't run, you just basically bricked your map. You can also turn your map into an eight mod map, which not only means that it gets re-rolled, it gets added mods on top. So that can get incredibly hard. And once again, you can't change them afterwards. You can also upgrade it by one tier. So at tier 16, that doesn't happen anymore. It actually turns into a Baal Temple, which is a special little map that is not on the Atlas, a little secret side level, I guess. But if you, for example, corrupt the T14, T13, it can upgrade by one. And the last thing that can happen is you can turn your map unidentified. This gives you an inherent 30% quantity bonus, which is very strong. And just so you know, all the mods that were on there do not get reshuffled. They're still on there. It's just not visible anymore. Now, gems can also be corrupted. You can get plus or minus one to level. Obviously, the plus one is what most people are seeking for whenever they corrupt a gem also get plus or minus to quality it goes up to 23 but you can only get that if you 
corrupted at 20 quality. Also, nothing could happen. Or it can turn the gem into a Val version. Now, usually you want to corrupt a gem when it's at level 20 and it has 20 quality for the best possible outcomes. However, I just bought some level one ground slams to show you the Val versions. If you see one of these might turn red and turn into the Val version. Yeah, right here, we hit one. Under the ground slam, you see Val ground slam. And this is a special version of your skill that has sort of a cooldown, which is soul based souls you get from killing monsters and also hitting unique enemies. You note that not every skill has a Val version though, so you have to research before. And on the top, at the end, we have the double corruption, which is possible through the incursion temple from Alva. If you set up the correct rooms, you can get those double corruptions and that can give you up to two implicit modifiers on items, which are very sought after, as well as that you can double corrupt your gems not only can you get, for example, from 20 to level 21, you could get a 21 with 23 quality. However, one of the caveats of double corrupting is you can't just brick your item, you can actually delete it. So as with all of these corruption things, if you're a completely new player, stay a little bit away from them until you know what you want with your build. And let's talk about divination cards. They are basically itemized version of parts of items. So for example, I have Azarin's reward right here. It says one out of nine. And it says down here, as an outcome, you get a corrupted prismatic jewel. What that means is if you have nine of these cards, you can turn them in for whatever it says on the card. So for example, if you have a full set of a divination card, it turns blue. Here I have seven out of seven, the trial. And as an outcome, it gives me a corrupted tier 15 map. All I have to do is go to Lily in my hideout, trade divination cards, boom. I click on trade and now I get whatever outcome was on the divination card. And these are more than just cool random bits you find on the ground. You can actually target farm them. Some of these drop in very specific zones. This is especially important if you are on solo cell found. For example, let's say you need a poet's pen on solo cell found for your build, but you can't trade with people. So what you do is you see a dab of ink, which if you get nine of those, you get a poet's pen. You go to the PUEDB, the PUE database, you type in a dab of ink on top and now you scroll down and you can see card tags and you see exactly where they drop. And you can go to that region and farm it over and over or if it's in maps, target those maps. The problem mostly is that they're pretty rare. So don't assume that you're going to get it as quick as if you just trade it with somebody. Then let's talk about trading. I actually made a video about trading a while ago that I will link down below. Here I will only cover the very, very basics. In order to trade, you need either a premium stash tab or you need to upgrade the stash tabs, the free stash tabs that you're given to premium. However, do note that in all of the stash tabs that you buy, you can trade in. None of these you need to upgrade. Usually the only ones you need to upgrade are the ones you get for free at the start. So here I have a stash tab and I want to sell my lockbook right here. I put it in, then I first have to right click on the tab and make it public. Now here I see I can price each in item individually, which I'm gonna do, but you can also set a price on all of them. So let's say you have a tab and all of them you can set at, for example, 10 chaos. If you don't know, chaos orb is the current like default trading currency. So you set it to 10 chaos and now everything that is in this stash tab will be priced at 10 chaos. However, we're going to set the prices individually, right? So for example, now we can right click on any item in here and make a note for ourselves negotiable price, usually just go for exact price. And then you type in. So for example, here we can say and chaos. And now you see down here, it's priced at that. And it is priced on pavexile.com slash trade. This is where you find your items and you can trade with other people. You can buy currencies, for example, items I want. Let's say you want Val Orbs for some reason. And the items you have is you probably want to trade for currency. You can now click for search and it will show you exactly the rate at which these go at. And as you can see here, you can trade for whatever you want. Maps down here might be interesting for you. Essences, fossils, catalysts, whatever your heart desires. However, there's also search listed items. This is where you trade for rares and uniques. So for example, if I type in here, mage blood, I really want a mage blood. Let's see what that goes for. Oh boy, very, very expensive, but that's how you find them. Now you can also sell stacks of things. For example, let's say you want to sell these 20 over alchemies you can right click and say exact price. And now what you do is the first number will be how many chaos orbs you want for it. So let's say I want four chaos orbs four. so you click slash 20 of orb of alchemies. Boom. That's how it looks like. But yeah, that's about it. Thank you for watching this extremely long video.
if you want to see this in written form and maybe like look through some stuff again, I have a new player section over on maxroll.gg. I wrote that together with Tripolar Bear. So um, that's also a good resource. Also, if you want to check out my stream over on twitch.tv slash palstron, ask me questions or maybe just chill out with the boys. That's always a good thing as well. Oh, and definitely give me feedback down in the description. If I ever make longer videos like this, it's probably going to be for Path of Exile 2. So if I'm well prepared for that, even better. And uh, yeah, since I still don't have a slogan, see you next time.